Hi everyone, my name is Alma and I will be your moderator today. And we have today in our session, Advanced Architecture Examples, Kareem and Gregory. Kareem is a strategic cloud engineer at Google and he is part of the Google Cloud Professional Services Organization and focuses on data and analytics solutions. Gregory is a strategic cloud engineer at Google based in Germany who helps customers adopt GCP. He loves automating things, DevOps, learning new tech, and playing Ultimate Frisbee. Gregory, Kareem, welcome. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone, and thank you for attending our session today. Uh, today I'm going to walk you through a demo along with uh, my colleague Gregory. And in this session, we want to show you how to put together some of the topics and best practices you've heard about so far, especially with um, uh, the last session with Lorenzo. Uh, we're going to demonstrate a repository for a hypothetical data pipeline. However, instead of focusing on the details of Apache Beam transformations or like pipeline logic, instead, we're going to focus on the scaffolding components needed for a production-ready project. Meaning, we're going to focus on things like how to structure the pipeline to facilitate development and testing, how to do different levels of testing, like unit testing, transform integration testing, system integration testing, and how to build a continuous deployment pipeline that packages, tests, and deploy your pipeline to the uh, respective environment. And finally, how to automate the infrastructure components needed by the pipeline. So for example, things like uh, BigQuery tables, uh, GCS, uh, GCS uh, buckets, you can extend them to include permissions and whatnot. So things like that. You could see um, the repository that we are demonstrating. Um, you can see it as a kickstart triple or a template for you to extend with your own code or as a source for some useful code snippets and patterns uh, for your own project or for your existing project. And as you see here in the agenda, we are going to talk about multiple topics. So please bear with me if some points sound basic to you. The thing is we're trying to cater for a larger group of people with different levels of experience. And with that, uh, I, I have two screens here. So I'm going to be switching to um, uh, the demo screen that I have. So just a quick introduction, like within the Google Cloud Platform, uh, project on GitHub, we have a repository for professional services. That's the team that me and uh, Gregory are working for. And it has a lot of useful examples and tools if you're interested in GCP, if you're working with GCP. Um, we publish here usually examples and tools out of our uh, customer engagements, our projects. You can find a lot of useful examples, code snippets, uh, tools that is or like tools or solution that is doing or solving a specific problem. And one of them is this data flow production ready uh, repository that we're presenting today. So with that, let me walk you through it a bit. So as I said, this is a hypothetical pipeline, more uh, specific. It's for machine learning uh, data pre-processing. And for that, we're expecting like this kind of input for the pipeline. There's a very simple input, uh, a CSV file that is containing data for two sets of addresses. So we have four fields, like source address, source city, target address, target city. And the point here, or the goal of the pipeline, is to calculate two um, similarity features between the two sets of addresses. So we want to calculate address similarity and city similarity, based on some text uh, uh, distance methods or um, um, functions. So we're calculating the distance between source address target address, source city, and target city. So let's have a look on how are we doing that um, from a high level perspective. So this pipeline that we're demonstrating is written in Python. We also have another version of Java, but we're not gonna be using it today. So if we go to Python here, and again, like the, just a quick note, Python and Java won't make a big difference as we speak because we're talking about the other components, as I said, like the, uh, how to, to how, like, just like logical ways of uh, structuring the pipeline, how to do different kinds of testing, the continuous deployment pipeline, it has uh, less to do with the implementation language. So uh, within the Python module, we have the pipeline module itself. So in, in here we have some scripts to run 
tests and we have Docker files for the container image that we're going to be deploying. However, that's the main part of the repo or for the pipeline. And as you see, it's a traditional like Python uh, module. We have a setup file that is very important when it comes to packaging the um, pipeline code to run into data flow. We're going to be passing passing it around in a lot of configurations. We have the main function, the, the main module, the entry point, and we have the pipeline code structured in Python modules like that, like the traditional Python that you can uh, see anywhere. So let's have a look on the main function or the main uh, the main method here. As you see, the first steps of um, of this pipeline is that we're parsing a number of arguments, uh, three of them. We need the path for the input CSV, and we need two names or two specs for the query tables, one to store the results, and one to store the errors that we encounter during uh, processing of the data. So in this example, we also want to highlight some of um, the useful patterns that you can find in Apache B. For example, having um, multiple outputs, or what we call side outputs. Also want to demonstrate how to do, uh, use uh, side inputs and how to use counters. I'm going to be showing that within the pipeline. So the first actual step of the pipeline is that we're reading this abbreviation file from uh, the local repository. And basically, what we want to do here is to apply some cleaning on the addresses that we have. So we want to map things like str to street, uh, rd to road, like this kind of abbreviations in addresses, av to avenue, so this kind of things. And we want to read or we want to have this mapping or dictionary. Basically, we're reading it here into a Python dictionary. And we want to make it available for all the processing nodes, all the data flow nodes, so that they can access it locally and do element by element uh, transformation or uh, cleaning. I'm going to show you how we're using it once we come to this point. And you can see for the pipeline itself, we start the beam pipeline like that, and we're structuring it into three main components following uh, the ETL abbreviation. So the first one, we're logically grouping all the transformations needed or the steps needed for extracting and parsing the data only. The second step all the steps needed to clean and calculate and basically all, to do all the transformations that we have. And finally, we're loading the data, the results into BigQuery table, like here. And we're also doing that for uh, the parsing errors that we uh, that happened during the pipeline. And one one way or like one way to explain why we're doing it this uh, in this exact way is that this would facilitate our testing. So think for example. This one, like this P transform that encapsulates all the processing, uh, all, all the core processing logic of the pipeline could be tested in isolation. And we can automate this testing using static inputs. Like I don't need to care about reading from uh, CSVs, parsing, GCS, or the query. I don't care about that. I just need to focus on testing the uh, core transformations of the pipeline using static input. And if we're not doing it this way, it would be hard to do so. Like imagine if we have one pipeline that contains all the steps under each other, like read, do the spar do, or like uh, do function, uh, apply these transformations and write. It would be hard for us to isolate steps in between and do the proper unit testing or integration testing on that. So let's have a quick look on what's happening in the extract uh, transform. In this one, uh, I'm going to show you like two main um, patterns with Apache Beam. So first of all, you understand, like I think by now you know the difference between a p-transform and a do function. Uh, basically, a p-transform is a logical grouping of a set of other steps like do functions, reading from files or from databases, and so on. So in this one, we're reading, we're using Beam IO to read from uh, the CSV file that we just have. We're doing like a quick reshuffle just for performance reasons. In case of reading big files, we need to shuffle them into uh, smaller components. And then we're applying the um, parsing logic via a do function. So here we're applying beam or part do. And we have a do function, parse csv, uh, that is doing something 
a bit interesting here. It has, like it's using this with outputs method. And basically, what does that mean? It means that this do function is returning multiple outputs. So this do function will return multiple, like an array of P collections or a dictionary of P collections and records and errors. And then later on, like in the next step, we can access them or like index them separately. So you can see that we're extracting uh, the, um, the records only by indexing the records and errors uh, uh, array with this name, the like correct output tag, and the same thing for the errors. So let's have a quick look on the do function itself and how it's creating these multiple outputs, or like this beam pattern, the side, um, side outputs. So this one, this do function, as you see, uh, demonstrate two, two things. First of all, we want to have some counters. So these counters can help us to base, or like use metrics in general. And one way or one instance of metrics are counters. So uh, in this one, we want to count the number of input records, the number of the correct records that we could parse, uh, we could parse and the number of uh, rejected records. All these kind of counters would be available to you in the data flow UI once you deploy the pipeline and it's running. And it's very useful when you have streaming pipelines, for example, because while the um, job is running, you can see these kind of counters and take actions. Or uh, what is even better is that these counters or these metrics are being written to uh, automatically to a stack driver. It's being collected and written to stack driver, where you can automate uh, more. Um, uh, custom dashboards or alerting rules whenever the number of rejected records reach uh, some limit, like do something, like send this pop sub message that automates some other workflow, whatever you can think about. Counters here in, in the process function itself that is processing element by element. We're checking, uh, we do some simple checks. We want to ignore the header file, and otherwise, we um, parse the line itself simply by tokenizing it based on the um, separator. Uh, in the case, we pass the record correctly. We increment the counter for um, correct records. And if you see here, whenever we're just processing an element or start processing an element, we're increasing or we're incrementing the uh, counter for uh, input records. And whenever we have an output, we increment the counter for rejected records. multiple outputs. So basically, we are returning or like yielding two, um, two constructs called tagged outputs. So think about them as P collections, like a named P collection in one way or another. So we're creating in this one, in this, in this path, we're creating a tagged output of this name, the static name, and we're including the record, uh, the record that we just correctly processed in here. And output for the errors, we're doing another tag output like this, with this name and this uh, payload or with this record. So basically, in this case, we want to create a new kind of record or like a simple tuple dictionary that has the error message and the row line that caused the, the failure or this error. So let's go back to. <clears throat> The P transform itself, uh, that's what you see like with outputs, returns multiple um, tagged outputs, and that's how we're using them, or how that's how we're extracting them and returning them to the main function. And that's why basically here we have two P collisions. So it's easy with the parsing errors, we directly write it to uh, BigQuery like that using the option or the configuration that the parameter that we got from the user, like the error, um, we're writing into the errors VQ table. The interesting part happens with the parsed records. So in here, you can see that we start with the parsed records, the P, the P collection, and we're applying to it the second uh, P transform, the pre-processing transform. So you can see in the pre-processing transform, here it takes the abbreviation dictionary the one that we read in here. And that's basically we do the side input 
uh, or like later on, like this would be passed to a new function, and that's how we do the site input pattern. So let's have a quick look again on what's happening here. So this is another P transform the, that encapsulates all the transformation logic or the core transformation logic of the pipeline. And it basically does two, uh, two, two main steps. The first one is that we clean and transform the data that we have while applying the abbreviation mapping that we talked about, this one. And the second one is to calculate the similarity features given the, the, the parse clean P collection or the parse clean input that we have. We calculate the similarity features, which are the output to the pipeline. Quickly, I just want to show you here how we do the, um, the site inputs. So if you remember, like the this is a do function, and in every do function, there is a process method that is processing an element by element. However, if you want to extend that, and that's like pretty straightforward in Python, especially, if you want to extend it so that it accepts any other uh, input, you can just add it as it is here. So this is the abbreviation. It's a Python dictionary. You don't need to pass it as a P collection or any in any in any kind of wrapper, just a dictionary, and then the Beam SDK would take care of um, spreading it or like um, sending it to the um, data flow worker nodes. So again, as I said, like we're not focusing that much on what's happening in the pipeline. I just want to show you some uh, high-level patterns and why are we structuring the pipeline in this way. And as I said, this is basically to facilitate how we're doing um, testing or several layers of testing. So with that, let's have a, 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 let's have a look on the different kinds of testing that we're talking about and how are we applying them in Apache, in, in, in Dataflow or Apache B. So probably you've seen this diagram uh, somewhere in the previous sessions or the next sessions. But uh, yeah, this laser. So as you see, like we have different different uh, layers within the pipeline that we have. So we start with the do functions, like the let's say the atomic unit of transformations in Apache Beam. We have some other uh, Python, like straightforward Python utility functions as well that we want to unit test. So for these ones, we're doing unit tests in isolation without reading from input data sets or writing, just with static input. And then if we combine some do functions together into a P transform, like we did with the transformation uh, P transform that I just showed you, this could be either a composite transform unit test or uh, what we call like a transform integration test. So it depends on how many um, P transforms you're putting on their test. Anyways, the important point here is that for this level of testing and this level of testing, we want to automate them without, we want to automate them in isolation. We don't want to read from the input or from the output. We just want to use static data and have an, a, a static output compare them and keep repeating this every time we have a build, every time we're deploying the pipeline to uh, our environment. The last kind of testing is either like system integration test or end-to-end -end test, like this one. And as you can see, this one will not only test the core transformations or the functions within the pipeline, it also tests out the deployment of the pipeline. So what if we build a data flow template as we're going to be doing? And in the unit test, we're just unit testing the transformations. But after deploying the pipeline, something goes wrong. Maybe I had a problem with uh, the Docker image that I'm using, and the, and the data flow job is not triggering. So this kind of system integration test is, is very important, and we can do it in, in different scopes or different ways. So for example, uh, we could read like sample static input as part of our continuous deployment pipeline. We stage it somewhere, like on, on in CSV, you can stage it on a GCS bucket and uh, write the data to some uh, staging or like uh, testing BigQuery uh, results and just do a smoke test. Like, are we having the expected number of records in the expected tables or not? Or we can run it into 
to end full data set and test things like uh, performance metrics and, and things like that. So these are the different kind of levels of testing that we're talking about. And I want to go back to the code and show you how are we doing that within the pipeline. So Python, we have the testing module. So the first one is very straightforward, uh, just as an example. We have a utility function that is mapping abbreviations, the one that is taking things like str, convert it into street, and so on and so forth. And this is basically a straightforward Python unit test. There's nothing about beam in here. But we should, like in a production uh, data flow pipeline, we should also be testing these kind of things. So here we're having the abbreviations. We are applying these abbreviations. We have the expected uh, results, and we're doing an assertion. So basically, we're going to do the same thing, but using some Beam, Apache Beam uh, SDK uh, methods that could be useful for that. So if we go back to tests, let's start with the parse CSV. If you remember, this one was a do function. So we create a unit test case, um, like a test case as this one. We're testing this, uh, this do function, only the do function. And if you remember, this is the do function that is reading the input and returning two outputs. I want to show you how do we test like this kind of two outputs or uh, the side outputs pattern. Uh, we basically create um, some input um, accepted records. So this one is, as this line should be parsed by the pipeline. This one should be rejected because it's missing the city attribute. We combine them together into input data, like accepted records and rejected records. And we have the same for expected results, one for the ex expected successful results, which is basically parsed into a record, not just a line like that, and the expected rejected um, entry uh, including the error, uh, the error message that you have and the rejected uh, line itself. How do you do unit testing then? Um, the Apache Beam SDK contains this test pipeline class that we could use. So it, we instantiate a, a pipeline and we start by creating, I think this is like might be the most important part of the unit test, the create function. So instead of reading from external sources like PubSub, GCS, BigQuery, whatever that is, you can create a P collection out of some static input. So in this case, we have the, the static input and we're creating it, um, or we injecting it into the pipeline using the create function. And then to test the do function, we're just applying it in this test pipeline like this, the same way we're using it in the uh, pipeline itself. So we have this part do, we're applying this do function, and it's also using the with outputs method, the same as the pipeline, returning two outputs. So we have the, uh, <clears throat> the first output is the, the first tag output. You can access it via its name, correct output tag, collect the value behind this, uh, this tag, and the same thing for uh, the wrong one. And you're doing basically the same thing as the Python unit test. We're doing assertions. We assert that this P collection is equal to this P collection. And we have both of them. So that was how to unit test a do function. Let's have a look on how to do that for a P transform. So Unit testing a p-transform in the way that we designed or um, structured the pipeline is is what we the, that's what I want to highlight here. So again, we have all the transformations or the core core pipeline transformations included in one p-transform. Of course, depends on the pipeline size. If it's too complicated, you can split into multiple, uh, let's say, like major steps. But in this way, you can put the core transformation under test without the need of reading data from external sources or writing it to other external sources. So in this one, we're creating um, the input data as um, like an array of uh, records. And in this case, we only have one record. We have the expected output. And notice that in the expected output here, we have the similarity functions already calculated. 
the address similarity is zero because they are completely different, like street one and road one, but the similarity between cities, the city one and city one is the same, so we're expecting zero and one. We start the testing pipeline like that. In this case, since we tested, or like just to make it simpler here, we, we're not testing the mapping function. We should be doing that separately. But also like in this one, if you want to apply mapping, you can create the abbreviation dictionary in here. And uh, same thing, same pattern. We create the P collection, the input P collection using the create function with the static data. And then in the pipeline, we uh, apply the P transform, giving it this or passing it this abbreviation function. And as we seen before, like we are doing an assertion that the output P collection, this one is equal to the expected output. And that's it. So, this is about the basically how to test the do functions and how to test the uh, transform integration, uh, the transform integration test or the composite transform unit test. Uh, testing the p transform, like one p transform or multiple p transforms, if the same way I did. What about the system integration test? So for this, um, we need to have like some sort of a script because it's not being executed locally or like within the continuous deployment pipeline, it's being executed externally on the deployed um, or like on your environment, on GCP, for example. So if we go to the root repo in the root folder, we have this integration test. You can automate it with a bash script uh, with Python. Currently we're using bash, we want, but we want to port it to Python to be more uh, like easy, easily readable for more people. And going quickly to the logic of this, uh, the first step is that we're preparing some GCP test resources. So we're creating a GCS bucket for the integration test, uh, for the system integration testing. We're creating some uh, a BQ data set, a uh, couple of tables using the schema that we're storing in um, the BigQuery JSON schema that we're storing within the repository. So we're creating a results table and errors table. And then we, second step here would be to invoke or to run the flex template or the job template that we already deployed in a previous step. The regular is gonna talk about this part. Uh, we're executing it on GCP, passing it the parameters that we just created, like the integ system integration test parameters. And after it starts running, we need to loop on it, like loop every 60 seconds, we go and check is the job still running? Is it still running? Is it still running? And we either have a, a failed job status and then the integration test fails because the job had an error, or it's successful. If it's successful, we move to the last part of the system integration test, which is checking the results and the error tables on BigQuery. So for this, we, we created this simple uh, query. We Since we created the input to this uh, integration test, we know the content of the file. So in this simple example, we know that we go, we, we're expecting two records to be inserted in the uh, successful results table and one in the, um, in the error table. And we're trying to generate a query that returns only true or false based on, on some binary flag. So, we're checking if the first table is, has two, true or false, if the second table has uh, one record, true or false, and then we're using an and in between them, just like a, just any way to return either the query has succeeded or like the, uh, this uh, system integration checking query has uh, successfully ran or not. If it runs correctly, we uh, terminate the system integration test, everything is okay, we can move forward. If not, it would fail, and by, by turn it will fail, for example, the continuous deployment pipeline that is actually invoking this uh, script every time we're doing a uh, commit or every time we're deploying to an environment. So with that, um, we talked about the pipeline structure, we talked about testing, 
The last thing that I want to quickly talk about is the data flow templates. So we mentioned that uh, at one point, we're gonna, of course, we need to deploy this pipeline. Uh, and there are like multiple ways of running pipelines and data flow. Let's explain them very quickly here. So the first one is that like you do like um, on-demand uh, run commands. So you're a developer, you have your local environment, you have your code. Every time you submit a job to the data flow uh, runner or the data flow service, you're basically doing two steps in one go. So the data flow service would stage your code dependencies in a GCS bucket it will start reading from it and run the, your pipeline on data flow. Every time you wanna run this job, you have you need to have access to uh, like the local environment, the pipeline code, dependencies, and so on. But if, as a developer, I want to deploy the template once or deploy the job once and let other users run it as well. In this case, we need to separate between staging the pipeline and executing the pipeline. So that's where we use uh, templates. And we have two different kinds of templates, classic templates and flex templates. And the only difference is how do they store the code and dependencies. So <clears throat> for classic templates, whenever the developer initiates a like, template request, like create template request, we create a template file in GCS containing some metadata description about the pipeline, the kind of parameters that is expecting. And this where you have staged the code and dependencies. And whenever a user is submitting a run request for a template, they are just referencing it, referencing the template file that is on GCS. The request is executed by Dataflow. And by turn, Dataflow knows where to pick the code and dependencies and run your pipeline. Flex template is exactly the same way, except for how instead of um, packaging your um, or staging your code and dependencies on a GC GCS uh, bucket, you're actually building a container image that is also being referenced by a template file so that if a user wants to run this uh, template, they can pass it to Dataflow and reference uh, the template file in GCS. How do we quickly, so in this, uh, in this example, we are using flex template or in our repo we're using flex template. And in order to do that, we need to have uh, a Docker file. So within Python, we have a Docker file that explains, a very simple one that explains how to package the pipeline code that we have. So we're starting the image from this Python 3 template for data for templates, like from the base. We're copying the uh, pipeline code. Uh, I think that the most important step here is that we are installing all the requirements, all the Python dependencies that we have in the repository. We're installing it using the pip on um, the image that we have. So for example, this uh, text distance Python library, we have it, we're having it in here. And finally, we're setting this environment variable, Python file, the main entry for our pipeline code. So that whenever Dataflow is invoking this uh, template or this job, it knows where to start the pipeline. And with that, I'll hand it over to Gregory, who's gonna talk about how to put all these steps together into a continuous deployment pipeline and how to automate the infrastructure components as well. Gregory, it's all yours now. Uh, thank you very much, Karim. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gregory, and in this project, I was responsible for the CI CD automation part. Uh, so the first step we had to do is to define the steps and their, their order to be, to be able to define the CI CD pipeline. Uh, so generally, to be able to execute the CI CD pipeline, we have to ex execute two steps. One is running the unit tests. Second is running the integration tests. Running the unit test is quite easy. We just execute the uh, shell script uh, Karim showed to us. For running the integration tests, we already have to deploy the template because integration tests would be running against the template. In this case, uh, to deploy the template, you have to build the Docker file. You have to push the uh, Docker image to the registry, and we have to 
uh, trigger the uh, gcloud cli command to build the template the next step so after that as a last step you can execute the uh, shell script which is running the integration tests so the next step you have to do is to, to choose the ci cd uh, tool so it could be jenkins it could be gitlab ci cd generally could be anything in this case we decided to use cloud build uh, first of all it's a uh, GCP project, and second, it is a managed product project, which uh, saves us from a lot of quite complicated questions like how to organize the access to the GCP project, how to store the credentials, how to update the plugins, how to manage the connections, and all other problems, which I believe might be a good uh, good point for a long talk on their own. So generally, you would expect uh, the cloud uh, cloud build YAML manifest uh, containing the cloud build steps to be in the uh, root of the repository. In this case, we, we have two different pipelines, one Java, one Python. And we believe that uh, Java and Python pipelines could have different steps for the CI CD pipeline. So our cloud build mm -hmm. uh, YAML file for the Python pipeline is located in a Python uh, folder, cloud build. So based on what uh, I told uh, regarding the steps which has to be executed, uh, you can see those five steps here. The first one is unit testing. So it just invokes the shell script uh, Karim showed us. Second is building the container. So it calls the uh, docker build command with a, a batch of parameters. Third one is push, so pushing the resulting build to the uh, GCR repository, uh, registry. Uh, next, executing the uh, data flow flex, build, uh, flex template build command, which will uh, generate the template and put it on a bucket. And last, running the integration test. So another shell script, five steps. Uh, we believe to make this script generic, uh, some of the uh, parameters, uh, so, some of the variables have to be parameterized. So like project ID or image name or image tag. Some of them uh, should be probably set once. That's why in the substitution block, they have the default values. Others should be defined on the runtime. Let's say like the image tag, uh, this parameter has to be probably uh, defined on each run based on your versioning uh, strategy. Might be you're gonna be using the uh, git uh, commit hash, Maybe you have some uh, type of a semantic versioning where you increase your version based on the uh, commit message. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you can pass these parameters either with the uh, cloud build command or define them in the defaults. How this pipeline can work. So let me demonstrate it. This is a gcloud builds submit command. Uh, so generally, if you execute this command without the parameters, it's going to search for the gcloud, uh, oh, sorry, it's going to search for the cloud build YAML file in the root folder. But in this case, as we have a separate cloud build YAML file for both uh, pipelines, we have to trigger the one from the proper directory, so from Python. Uh, when I execute this, cloud build command, it's going to trigger the cloud build. And you can see this cloud build process already running in my project. So I have to refer the page. And you see the exactly same pipeline currently running. Second, currently running here. It's all the steps. The whole pipeline will take uh, about 12 minutes to run. So I won't wait here until the end of this pipeline and we'll keep showing you things we did to automate this, uh, this CI CD pipeline. So I was able to execute this pipeline manually. But of course, you're not going to do it uh, in your every everyday development life. So probably you would prefer having something like uh, CI CD pipeline being triggered on push event. So let me configure the cloud build to, to run on push. For this, I will use the cloud build trigger. I choose a name to, for this trigger. 
and I want to execute this pipeline on any pull request. So technically, you can have different uh, branching strategy in your Git repository. In this case, uh, I will use the pull request, but you could use something like push the branch or push a new tag, whatever you choose here. Uh, the repository is the one I'm storing code at, and I want to execute it on any branch. Uh, the rest is, let me little check, not relevant. Uh, the most important thing is a cloud build file. So in this case, I need to define the cloud build file again, and it's going to be the file from the Python. So now I create a trigger, which is listening to a, a pull, pull request. Whenever pull request is being uh, created, it's going to trigger the pipeline. So currently, we have one cloud build running. Let me create a pull request so that you will see that the pipeline is going to be triggered the second time. Um, mm -hmm. So I switch to my current branch. It's going to be test feature tool. And I create the pull request. So I'm going to pull it back to my repository. And just give it a second. Yeah. So I pull from the test feature branch tool to the master branch. And then I click create pull request. So what's going to happen now? We're going to get a second uh, cloud build. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now it's running. So that's absolutely the same pipeline now being triggered not manually from the CLI, but automatically from the uh, cloud build uh, trigger on each uh, pull request. What is interesting here? is that I can get back the uh, pull. Uh, I can I can get back in my uh, pull request the result of the CICD process. So you can see the data flow trigger. This one is currently running. And it has a yellow sign, so which means that we are still waiting for the result here. Whenever this one going to succeed, which will take another 12 minutes, we will get a green sign here like that, saying that the pipeline is being run and we sure that whatever changes have been pushed to this branch, uh, they don't break something and they are ready to be uh, pushed into the master branch. Uh, and technically, if you want, we can also go to the settings and disable uh, merge of the branch into master and list all the requirements here are being fulfilled. So all the checks we need are being run. So the whole demonstration here, as I told, will take another 12 minutes. So maybe we will be able to see the result, result of it, or otherwise you'll have to trust me that it works. So meanwhile, I will walk you through another interesting topic. So this was a CI CD pipeline for the uh, data flow pipeline itself. But generally, each data flow pipeline would need additional pieces of GCP infrastructure, like buckets, like uh, BigQuery tables, maybe something different. Those things generally should be also automated. Why? Because you, whenever you push changes to your code, which uh, relies on some uh, parts of infrastructure already existing, uh, you should should have a guarantee that those those things are already there. So the current industry standard for the uh, infrastructure as code is terrible. In this case, in the repository. Quickly switch here. In the repository, we have a Terraform folder describing the uh, BigQuery tables which are used uh, by our data flow pipeline. This thing is here. So, just a second there. Yeah, those, the, those tables are being defined here in the schema folder. This is a JSON file containing the schema for the data flow, uh, for the BigQuery uh, tables. Now, what if you want to automate creation of those tables or maybe even uh, support it with a CI CD pipeline? To do that, we added another cloud build YAML. Generally, we believe that the infrastructure code should be separated from the uh, data flow pipeline code and would be residing in a different repository. But for the sake of simplicity of this example, they are now in the same, they are located in the, in the same repository. But to keep them logically separated, we use two different cloud build YAML files. 
the Terraform CI/CD pipeline is also quite a interesting topic on its own. So in this implementation, use the simplest approach, just run Terraform init, plan and apply. Generally, you would have way more complicated strategy here based on the branches. Maybe you'll produce plans, store this, them somewhere on the buckets, compare them and so on. So just see it as the simplest uh, possible uh, implementation to show the general approach, how this will be uh, handled uh, with this uh, cloud build CI CD. So three steps. First is Terraform init, which is just calling the init command. Second is plan. Uh, and the third one is apply. We also pass uh, the variables here. So in this case, uh, the project ID is not being passed explicitly, but cloud build is able to fetch the project where, where it is running. So we don't need to have uh, we don't have to to, to tell what our project is. Uh, cloud uh, cloud run will uh, cloud build will decide it based on, on on the project. Now, if I will execute this pipeline from the CLI, how I did it with the previous uh, how I did it with the previous CI/CD pipeline. Give it a second. I will cancel the running one and run another one. We will see two additional tables being deployed uh, to our GCP project. Uh, so let me show you how it looks now. This is the BigQuery, and currently in the uh, in the project uh, test one, I don't have any any tables. Now, if I execute this pipeline, and it will take uh, about 30 seconds to run, you will see two additional tables being created in this uh, data set. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's running Terraform init. The next step is going to be Terraform plan. And we should already see the execution plan. Yeah, so it highlights that several tables are going to be created. And now it switches to Terraform apply. Uh, and the pipeline is finished. So if I update the page, I will be able to see uh, two tables being created exactly here. So uh, this is a Terraform production ready uh, data set and ML preproc errors and ML preproc results. So you can see it from the uh, repository here. If I click on the schema folder, it's ML preproc errors and ML preproc results. If I will add additional file here, uh, I will get additional table uh, in the uh, data flow. Oh, sorry, in the BigQuery. Uh, technically, I can also automate this CI CD pipeline with the trigger. So if I go and let's say create a trigger and say that it's going to be a data flow TF, uh, data flow TF, and I'm going to be executing the pipeline, pipeline this time on every push to a branch. And the repository is going to be the same. And uh, the branch is going to be the same. Uh, it's going to be any branch. And I need a cloud build file. And in this case, I'm going to be using the uh, cloud build uh, TF file. And that's all. So in this case, this trigger is going to execute this ISD pipeline on each, uh, again, on each push to the repository. Uh, and I can show you this example from here. If I go to the uh, to the schema repository and create uh, additional schema file here, and let me copy the content from any uh, any existing file, let's say from this one, and insert here. And then all I need to do is to save it. Let me call it just test, and I save it. So what I will have to do now is pushing the changes. So I do git status. I see the changes in my file test JSON. So git add file name, git uh, commit this message. It's schema and I do git push 
and give me a second to copy the credentials. And now we should see the uh, CICD pipeline being executed from the history tab. And here we go. This one is, uh, nope, just give it another second. Nope, still not. Uh, let me quickly take a look here. So I pushed it to the test feature branch and this is the curse of the real time examples. Whenever you try to execute it, something goes wrong. Let me quickly check it from here. And let me quickly check it from the trigger. So I run it from the uh, feature test branch. Test feature two. This one. Hmm. Yeah, and now I see my uh, my Terraform uh, CI/CD pipeline running. It will take another thirty seconds, and we should be able to see additional table being created uh, in the BigQuery. So currently, it's a plan step running. And we're going to make here. So I see the test table. So in this case, it created a test table based on the update I pushed back to the repository, which automates the, uh, the infrastructure creation. And all I need to care about is uh, having my Terraform files being uh, in the proper place in the repository and pushing the updates to the Terraform file whenever I need additional part for the CI CD uh, pipeline. Uh, sorry, for the data flow pipeline. So with that, I believe uh, there was a story about the CI CD automation uh, for this data flow project. And I give the microphone back to Karim. Thanks, Gregory. Um... Yeah, I think that's time now for uh, Q and A. Um, I'm gonna be waiting for uh, your questions, and we can answer them uh, for the remainder of the session today.
I'm back. <laughs> Hello. I as was just seeing that there are some questions. Uh, this is from Dan. Can you use the Terraform to update existing BQ table schemas? For example, adding columns. I'm aware of the dragons as it relates to uh, as it relates to managing BQ table schemas as a part of CI CD pipeline. So uh, I believe Karim can add on that, but generally you're not allowed to remove tables from the BigQuery schema, and it's unrelated to uh, either uh, CI/CD pipeline or doing it manually. Uh, Karim, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and uh, Alma, you said like uh, which which tool uh, is being used in, in the question? Uh, Alma, you're on mute. Thank you. So the question was, can you use the Terraform to update existing BQ table schemas? So uh, generally Terraform gonna use uh, the uh, Google APIs anyway. So uh, if uh, deletion of the tables is, is forbidden for uh, BigQuery, it doesn't matter. Would you be using Terraform, anything else? You just cannot delete tables. You can add tables. Technically, you can do it with the uh, Terraform either. The way how we used to create them here. So if you will take a look at the uh, Terraform file, what we do there is just uh, scanning the folder for the .json files and applying anything you see there. So from this approach, uh, I'm not 100% sure you will be able to modify the tables. Uh, you will be yeah. definitely yeah, the thing is, like maybe for schema management is a bigger topic in general with databases like Terraform. With the, uh, might be like the tool to go for some other infrastructure components. But the same approach that Gregory explained with the like, cloud build and the containers deployment pipeline can be uh, used for other tools as well. Like for example, Liquid Base can like any kind of uh, uh, tools that can handle schema updates in a um, in a different way. That that's also valid. Doesn't have to be uh, Terraform. With Terraform, I believe, uh, updates won't be uh, won't be able to be like if you have updates on existing tables, or uh, that won't be uh, uh, possible with Terraform. But again, like Terraform itself is a tool; you can remove it, we put something else, and use the same approach with continuous. Uh, the questions are really building up in Slack. Um, and I don't think we're going to have time to get to all of them, but there is one more uh, question. How to debug the data flow in Terraform pipelines? So I believe this question boils down to debugging the uh, data flow in Terraform CI CD pipelines. So uh, I believe in this case, what uh, so deb debugging Terraform is also quite 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 a deep question on its own. So uh, based on what uh, are you using Terraform for? If it's the whole organization being deployed and like using the Terraform scripts, I believe it can be up to uh, the need of creation a test organization and the GCP to be able to create the infrastructure created with a Terraform, and you can use tools like TerraTest. But I mean. That's why I, I mentioned it in the very beginning. This Terraform pipeline is quite easy. It just grabs the files, deploy whatever whatever there is, the, the, there is and that, that's it. Mm. I believe the Terraform, uh, using the Terraform for the real GCP infrastructure will be way more deep and way more complicated topic, including the branching strategy, uh, producing plans, uh, analyzing the uh, plans, uh, storing plans somewhere on the bucket, then applying. So, this will be broken in, in, in many like smaller steps. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you would try to cover that within this uh, presentation, you definitely wouldn't have time for that. But generally, yes, so the, the Terraform and data flow pipeline testing is, is like the very, very big topic. OK, thank you very much, Grigory. I am going to cut off uh, the session there. There are more questions in Slack. 
So if there are more questions for Kareem and Gregory, please feel free to drop them there in Slack. And please remember that we will have a feedback survey and we will be posting that link in Slack and the YouTube chat. So thank you very much, Kareem and Gregory. For all of those out there listening to Beam College, remember that we will be going live again with the next session, which is testing and continuous integration. Please hang tight, stay right here. You don't have to go anywhere to, to get to that session, but stretch your legs in the meantime. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Bye-bye. Three, two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next session in BIM College. We are with Lorenzo Cagioni. Lorenzo is a strategic cloud engineer at Google based in Italy. He has multiple years of experience working in integrations and big data projects. And in his spare time, Lorenzo loves investigating areas where technology can help increase autonomy of people with disabilities. So uh, Lorenzo is going to talk to us about how to do uh, testing and continuous integration and delivery with Apache Beam. So uh, please carry on, Lorenzo. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Pedro, for having me. And uh, hello, everybody. And uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. I hope that uh, you're enjoying uh, the Bing College uh, so far, uh, and uh, you enjoy the presentation from my colleagues, uh, Gregory and uh, Karim. My name is uh, Lorenzo Caggioni, and I work uh, as a strategic cloud engineering in Google Cloud Professional Service Organization. I go with uh, he, him, and uh, for blind people and low vision people in the call, I'm a white male with brown eyes and dark blonde hair and beard. In this module, uh, we will explore uh, CI-CD aspect uh, in the context of Apache Beam. 
you saw uh, the previous uh, presentation uh, and uh, actual uh, uh, e example of uh, implementing it. Let's uh, see in this uh, presentation an overview of all uh, the topics uh, around uh, this. So in software engineering, uh, CICD refers uh, to the combined practices uh, of uh, continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery. CICD bring bridges uh, gaps between uh, development and operational activities and teams by enforcing automation in building, testing, and deployment of applications. When you want to deploy a data pipeline in production, those are probably the main CICD aspect you may need to take into account. We will start with tests, unit and system tests. Once we have checked that our pipeline is behaving as expected, we will move to the process of building and deploying our artifacts into production. And we will end the overview with the steps to validate the rollout. So let's start with the testing. Testing in BIM is summed up well by this uh, diagram. And uh, you can read uh, this uh, from the center to the out of the diagram. So all uh, pipelines revolve uh, around transforms. And the lowest level we typically deal with uh, within BIM is uh, the two function. And uh, we want to validate uh, their behavior with the uh, unit tests. So then we can combine several uh, do functions to create a composite transform. And also we want to uh, do the unit test for those uh, uh, transforms. One uh, more layer out, we are encapsulating the entire pipeline, but excluding the IO transform. These are our integration test, or sometimes also uh, called the pipeline unit test. The next step is uh, to incorporate a small amount of uh, test data, probably coming from the production data, for system integration test. These, uh, are, these uh, use uh, the actual IOS, but only a percentage of uh, the total test data. And then uh, finally, we have uh, the end-to-end -end test that uh, use a copy of our production data and uh, test the pipeline with the full test data set. As you probably learned from uh, previous uh, uh, talks do during the Apache Bing College, BIM need a runner. And you can leverage different runners for different tests you have to perform. You can use uh, the direct runner for your unit testing uh, or also the small integration test and to uh, ensure the logic is uh, correct. Uh, and this is true unless uh, you have uh, very um, sparse filters or joints that will have uh, no data at small scale. But for sure, never use the direct runner for performance test. By design, will perform badly. Use your production runner for end-to-end -end, uh, integration testing, specifically integration test with uh, your data sources. OK, and uh, here you can find a typically, typical pipeline lifecycle, as uh, you saw from the previous uh, talk. You start uh, the development uh, on your uh, development environment, uh, and you typically run the pipeline on a direct runner or sometimes uh, on a sandbox uh, environment uh, to test it uh, with uh, the production runner, such as uh, the direct uh, data flow runner. OK, your code is working and uh, it's ready to go. You can submit uh, to your uh, code repository. The push, the push, as uh, uh, Gregory and uh, Karim show, will trigger some uh, the, the building, the build, and uh, it will run uh, unit tests uh, for the, the pipeline. 
And then assuming all the tests are okay, this uh, will be moved to the to pre-production and later to production. Okay, let's uh, have a deep dive uh, on uh, unit testing. It is still good practice uh, to write uh, unit test uh, for individual methods uh, that uh, implement uh, business logic. And uh, in the context of uh, Apache Beam, uh, building blocks uh, of your pipeline are p transform and or do function. And uh, during those tests, uh, you have uh, to assert the behavior of uh, your application. They usually run locally on your uh, dev environment test with uh, no dependency with the external systems. To set it up uh, uh, on uh, your environment uh, using uh, um, the Apache Beam Java SDK, you need, uh, and, uh, um, you, you need uh, to include the JUnit. And uh, those uh, utilities uh, are included in the Python SDK. Uh, in the Python SDK. Okay, now we have access uh, to the Beam testing utilities. Let's see the tool that we have access uh, to. The first one is uh, the test pipeline. Test pipeline is a, a class included in the Beam SDK specifically for testing transform. For test, you just need to use the test pipeline in place of a pipeline when you create the pipeline object. The other uh, element that you, we have access to is the pAssert object. pAssert will perform an assertion on the content of a P collection and uh, you can uh, check uh, that the output of a transform contains element in any order or uh, in an order uh, that uh, you uh, specify and many other checks. So we have uh, the two building blocks. Uh, let's see how we can uh, combine them together. And uh, as you can see here in the slide, uh, we can uh, create uh, our test pipeline we can uh, have uh, um, we can apply a transform to uh, our p collection and then we can uh, run an assertion on the output p collection but uh, being able to write a unit test involve also the way you write your pipeline and uh, here we see a simple anti-partner example when it comes to creating testable pipeline. Please always prefer named subclasses to anonymous one, since the anonymous one are not testable. So if you compare this example with the previous one, here we have <coughs> We have named uh, subclasses, and uh, with the, the name subclasses, we can uh, run a test on uh, all those uh, subclasses, split into words function, the generate anagrams function, and so on. So the following Java code sample use the pAssert class to check for correct output form. If uh, we want to, to test the generate anagrams function, we can create a P collection with a sample input data, the word friend in the example, and pass the collection to the transform function. And uh, we can conclude the test calling the P assert to compare the output of the transform function to the expected result. And uh, the same is uh, for Python. Again, we have uh, the test pipeline uh, included in the uh, Beam Python SDK. And uh, using a Python unit test package, we can create a test to check our ptransform 
count words in this uh, example and uh, use psert uh, to assert the uh, expected re result. Oops. Okay, the example we saw was uh, for a batch uh, pipeline. Uh, a similar approach is uh, for a streaming pipeline, unit testing a streaming pipeline. The, the, uh, when uh, you test a streaming pipeline, you have to keep it into consideration that the input data need a timestamp. And to create data elements with a timestamp, you can use the create transform, as you can see in the, the snippet in the slide. OK. Now we have uh, our pipelines uh, building blocks tested and working as expected. We can move uh, to the next step. We want to check if our entire pipeline is working as expected. Those are the integration tests or also known pipeline unit test. For uh, integration testing, uh, we are really testing the entire pipeline, except, except for the source and the sync. Let's assume we have a pipeline that, uh, given a collection of integers, calculate weather stats, mean, max, average. We will start creating a set of example data. We will run the pipeline using the uh, sample data, and we will conclude the uh, pipeline asserting the, the output with the expected result. And uh, this is the same even if uh, you have uh, multiple data input. For example, in the actual pipeline on the left, on the left where we have uh, two inputs, store and online, uh, as uh, two different uh, data sets or sources. We want to change both input with a create statement. And uh, usually we don't want to use the actual sources to end things because the data in the sources can change and testing against the actual sources can add unwanted load to our system. But also, it may not cover all the possible corner cases that we need and want to, to test. So instead, we do something like on the right. We use the create of methods to create a smaller amount of uh, uh, data. So we handcraft uh, testing data and provide uh, this uh, as input to our pipeline to do integration testing. We don't write a result to the actual sync. Instead, we use psert to test that the data going to the sync looks like we expect. So, now we're moving uh, on testing uh, with uh, a larger amount of data. And uh, we might decide to take a sample of data from uh, our uh, sources. And uh, when we do the sampling, uh, probably we want also to apply some uh, anonymization to uh, remove uh, PII data so we can eventually use uh, DLP APIs, for example, uh, uh, to have anonymized data. And uh, this is uh, mostly helpful uh, for feeling confident that uh, your pipeline can deal uh, with uh, larger volumes uh, of data correctly. But it, this is not really a substitute for your uh, previous uh, unit testing uh, because it may not cover all uh, the corner case that uh, you may uh, face uh, using your uh, production data. OK, now sometimes we want to test uh, our pipeline with uh, even larger amount of data. And uh, for this, uh, usually you want to create a copy 
of uh, your data, production data, and uh, you want to uh, run your pipeline and compare the result and check your result uh, first in a test environment and sometimes you also have a second environment for user acceptance uh, test and uh, usually it's uh, at this stage that uh, you do the uh, performance test now that you have the, the production data load okay for larger scale and uh, integration testing you will probably do things differently depending on whether your pipeline is a batch or streaming pipeline for batch pipelines once you have done an integration test on a reasonable amount of data you can probably move on to validating the pipeline with the data at a larger scale there aren't really many deployment choices apart from deciding between templates for example if you are using dataflow but for streaming pipelines you need to decide how you are going to deploy your pipeline before you can begin validating it and another difference to take into account between batch and streaming is the deployment method for batch pipelines we saw that uh, there's not too much to uh, decide but uh, for streaming there's uh, uh, some decision that uh, you have uh, to take for example if uh, you want to update your existing pipeline or you need to drain your pipeline before uh, deploying the new one or if uh, you're gonna to cancel your pipeline so streaming pipeline uh, with we saw that it is a little bit more complex to deploy and test so let's focus uh, on those pipeline for a minute so to test uh, streaming pipelines we also have an additional util class the test stream in addition to the feature we have for batch pipelines with the test stream you have the ability to handle the watermark and assert all possible scenario moving the watermark for example we are able to advance the watermark between producing elements which means we can simulate situation like like uh, late data as you can see in the example we can use the advanced watermark tool to move uh, to move the watermark and being able to assert data on all scenario again it's uh, always uh, important to assert all possible uh, scenarios and uh, keep in mind that the test stream at the moment is not supported on all runners for example uh, it is supported by the, the direct runner but not by the data flow runner google is working on getting support for test stream to work on data flow runner but uh, it's not ready yet flink has partial support for uh, test streaming today okay let's now talk about some other peculiarity for of the streaming pipelines in the context of a large integration test to have appropriate data to perform your large integration test you need the data input to test your pipeline without impacting the production pipeline and uh, downstream uh, systems if you work with the messaging system for example uh, cloud um, pubsub you can easily attach an extra subscription to a specific topic this may come uh, with uh, some extra cost but uh, for any major update you should probably consider cloning the production environment 
and running through the various uh, life cycle events. You may also consider doing this activity on a, a regular cadence, such as after you had uh, a certain number of uh, minor updates uh, to your pipeline, just to check uh, that uh, everything is working as expected. And, uh, but this is not uh, the only option. Depending on uh, uh, the use case uh, you are working on, Another option is the ability to carry out an A-B testing. If the data you are streaming can be split, uh, for example, uh, on entry to the topic, and the sync can tolerate a different version of uh, the transform, then this gives you a great way to ensure everything goes smoothly in production, running an A-B test when, uh, when possible. OK. We have now our streaming pipeline tested and working as expected. And we want to deploy it. Depending on the runner, you may have a different option. Let's see the option we have for Cloud Data Flow. The first one is the update. The update replaces an existing job with an updated one, preventing in flights, buffers, and state. The second one is the drain. This will close Windows immediately and uh, will process data in flight, but uh, Windows may be incompleted because uh, some message belonging to the uh, window that uh, you're closing may are still in the uh, messaging system. And the third option is to cancel the pipeline. This will cancel the job immediately. Data in flight can be lost, obviously. Update is a really powerful feature of uh, Cloud Data Flow that uh, allow you to update an existing pipeline and uh, keeping all the in-flight data processed uh, within the new pipeline. This option is available in a lot of situations. Thought, uh, as uh, you would expect, uh, there are certain pipeline changes uh, that uh, will prevent the use of this feature. This is why it's important to understand the behavior of various transform and things during different lifecycle events as part of your standard SRE procedures and protocols. Okay, just remembering, remembering the, the free option in more details. So, the update option is uh, particularly useful on scenario where you want to improve your pipeline code without changing the business logic, probably. Or you want to um, roll out uh, a bug fix, for example, in your code. And, uh, but probably it's uh, not the best scenario sometimes for uh, data changes for probably, but uh, it really depends uh, on, uh, on your use case. And uh, when you uh, uh, um, update your job, the Cloud Data Flow service performs a compatibility check between your current, currently running job and your potential replacement job. The compatibility check ensure that uh, things like uh, intermediate state uh, information and buffered data can be trans transferred from your current pipeline to the new pipeline. Also, keep in mind that uh, changing the windowing or triggering strategy will not affect data that is already buffered or in flight. Okay, so if you try to uh, update uh, your pipeline, the compatibility check may fail. 
and uh, you need to take into account uh, and uh, explore one of the other two options, drain or cancel. The drain feature will stop pulling data from your sources and finish the processing uh, all the data remaining in the pipeline. You may end up with the incomplete window aggregation in your downstream sinks, and this uh, may not be an issue for your use case, but if it is, you should have a protocol in place to ensure that when the new pipeline starts, the partial data is dealt within uh, within a, a way that matches your business requirement. Not that a drain operation is not immediate, as Cloud Data Flow needs to process all the source data that was read. In some cases, it might take several hours, depending on, on your data, uh, data pipeline uh, lo logic. OK, and uh, the last option is uh, cancel. This uh, will halt all data ingestion and processing as soon as possible. As mentioned before, you may lose any uh, in-flight data. Another drawback is that you, you incur some downtime between the time when you are terminating your uh, current pipeline and the time you are able to start the new pipeline. However, the advantage of this approach is that it's uh, simple to conserve or drain the existing pipeline and uh, launch the new job uh, instead of updating the pipeline. So take into account all pro and cons of uh, the different uh, scenario. If we want to recap uh, all those uh, um, options, uh, you, you can follow this uh, uh, diagram. So for streaming pipeline, we can um, we have a di different uh, option. So if it's uh, the first uh, uh, run, just deploy it. Otherwise, if you can apply, uh, update, try to update your pipeline. If it's not an, an option, you, you can cancel or drain. And uh, if it's always a good practice to uh, get familiar on all uh, three options, because uh, maybe your first option is, uh, for example, to update your pipeline, but uh, for some reason uh, you ended up uh, to uh, need to cancel your pipeline or drain your pipeline. So be familiar on uh, what's happening uh, in all the other options, on all the other scenarios, uh, so you are prepared and you know how your uh, entire system behave uh, when uh, you do a drain or you cancel your pipeline. OK, so now we have uh, our pipeline working. We want to build uh, our artifacts. When building your artifacts, uh, keep in mind uh, the version of uh, BIM SDK you are using uh, as uh, other framework, uh, also being used uh, semantic version. And the version number use the form of uh, major, minor, incremental. And um, the major uh, changes uh, are incompatible with uh, the previous uh, version usually. And uh, the minor version uh, is just uh, related to bug fixing or adding uh, compatible features. And the build system is usually uh, Mavern or Gradle for uh, Java. And uh, it's typically that uh, you'll need uh, to pull in uh, more than just uh, the core uh, uh, Apache Beam. Okay, let's move uh, to the deployment. And uh, this is something that uh, change depending on the type of the pipeline, streaming versus batch. For batch pipeline, the most common approach, as we saw also from Gregory and Karim, 
is uh, to use template, standard or flex, depending on the scenario. Other people, uh, yeah, and uh, um, so the other option is uh, to, uh, but template are not the uh, only option. There are uh, some other options depending on your overall uh, ar ar architecture. Uh, another option could be to have uh, and provide a runnable jar to an orchestrator, for example, Airflow or Cloud Composer, and let the orchestrator run the pipeline passing variables with uh, the pipeline option parameter. And uh, when you run a pipeline, always provide a unique name with uh, some sort of uh, naming convention that uh, will help you monitor and troubleshooting your pipeline in case of uh, failure. The name needs to be unique within the project. This is uh, uh, also useful. Uh, it's useful not just uh, for troubleshooting, but it also prevent uh, two copies of the same pipeline from accidentally being started. Similar checks and best practice works for streaming pipelines too. Specify a unique name for your pipeline, but for streaming probably it's a good practice also to create a backup copy for your pipeline. Some sources like PubSub, and the uh, Kafka let you replay a stream from a specific point in processing time. This feature, when available, lets you create a backup of the uh, stream data for reuse if required. One example would be a rollout of a new pipeline that has a subtle bug not couched in unit test, end-to-end -end testing, or at the AB uh, testing phases, the ability to replay the stream in those ideally rare situation allow the downstream data to be corrected without doing a painful one-off data correction exercise. Okay, and the last uh, um, best practice uh, with the streaming uh, pipeline is uh, to create uh, multiple replica of your pipeline. It's similar to uh, backup your pipeline option we just uh, mentioned. However, rather than creating the pipeline to be replayed in case of an issue, you spin up one or more pipeline to process the same data. And if the primary pipeline update produces an unexpected bug, then one of the replica is used instead to read the production data. And this is another uh, approach to deploy your pipeline. Okay, we are at the final step of our journey and we want to validate the deployment of our pipeline. Also, this step is different between batch and streaming pipeline. For batch pipeline, they will fail automatically after a certain amount of uh, uh, failures and uh, you'll get quickly the output of uh, your deployment that is broken. But uh, it is still important to continually monitor your metrics of the pipeline, such as uh, messages processing rate, the number of workers, uh, in case uh, the pipeline is running abnormally. For streaming pipeline, they will not uh, fail automatically, even after repeating failure. In this case, uh, it's even more important uh, to monitor processing rates, uh, watermark advancement, uh, and uh, other metrics uh, to be able to act uh, properly and uh, fix uh, the pipeline timely. Okay, and uh, with uh, this, uh, we ended up uh, the loop of our CI-CD uh, story from uh, test, unit test, integration test. We built our artifacts, we deploy it, and we validate 
it. I hope uh, you find this talk uh, interesting uh, and uh, please uh, stay connected uh, for uh, any uh, upcoming uh, um, session. And if uh, you have uh, any question, uh, happy to answer. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, let's give a minute to our participants to see if they have any questions. Sure. And uh, remember, everybody, that the slides for this presentation are available in the GitHub repository that you uh, have access to. Um, and uh, if there's anything, I mean, there's the repository and also please help us by rating uh, BIM College, uh, the survey that we have posted in the Slack and chat. Let me see if we have any questions. Apparently not, Lorenzo. Will you, are you in the Slack, Lorenzo? Yes. Okay. So, uh, We'll post a message in the Slack to uh, tagging you in case there are uh, somebody who watches the, the session later has any questions so that it's easier for them to reach you, okay? Sure. Thank, thank you so much, Lorenzo. And then um, remember everybody that our next talk is in 45 minutes. Uh, so we will see you in our next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next talk in BIM College. I'm happy to be here with Israel Reis, who I believe he's going to be our, our most popular speaker, or at least the one that we've seen the most. Uh, he is now going for his, what is it, Israel, your fourth session? Uh, no, 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 this is the second one. So I gave this one. This is the uh, second last, one? Okay. It's only the second one, so it's going to be the second one only. So. Okay. I've, I've, well, you've coordinated uh, several talks, right? I like a yeah. track of content. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I was getting confused. Well, anyway, uh, Israel is going to, uh, to present how to configure your data flow job. Um, this this talk is is runner specific on, on data flow, but I suppose uh, there's some some things that that can be done in in other runners. Or, or if you have any questions about how how this is different with other runners, please feel free to to ask them. Okay. So having said that, uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Israel. Please uh, please start. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Pedro. So thanks for having me again here. Um, my name is Israel, like the country. I work at Google as a strategic cloud engineer, and I work a lot with data flow. So um, today I'm going to be talking about specifically about data flow as a, as a runner of Apache Beam. Uh, we have actually two talks uh, today, th this one and the next one. The next one is going to also be specific about data flow, but there will be probably more tips that you can apply to other runners too. Okay. Not, not only to data flow. This one is going to be quite specific uh, to the case of data flow. So let's first learn about uh, how the data flow runner works. Okay, so data flow is the serverless uh, managed service uh, in Google Cloud Platform for running Apache Beam pipelines. Okay, so uh, mm, the, the, the workflow or the, the way you interact with uh, with uh, with data flow. It's like in any other runner. So you have some code that you are writing here, okay? And then you submit the the, the, the code to a regional endpoint, to an API. So you call Google Cloud Platform and you submit your code and your job. And um, uh, the code has to be also um, uh, copied to to somewhere in the in Google Cloud Platform, in this case, a uh, Google Cloud Storage, okay? Um, so when you when you uh, when when you run your job, so the first uh, step that happens uh, locally when you run your job is is that uh, Apache Beam computes the graph of your of your job, okay? And this has happened locally. So this it, this let's say this is a description of the job that is going to be run, and this is also now sent to to Dataflow, and uh, the runner tries to run uh, the the code in the cloud platform. In this case, uh, with compute engine um, uh, uh, machines, virtual machines. There's a very important detail here: is that the code that you write and the code that is actually run by the runner is not exactly the same. So this is a logical description of your uh, of your code of your pipeline and this is the physical job that is going to be run so there are certain optimizations that are applied to your job and the goal of this talk and partially the next one is is going to be to understand these optimizations and other optimizations that you can apply to in order to improve the performance of your job okay and when i say improving the performance of your job uh, it's implied that you're going to also reduce the cost. OK, so the, the goal of this talk is how to run your pipeline with maximum performance or what is the same, minimal cost. So um, let's learn a little bit about Compute Engine. The data flow has to run on top of virtual machines in, in Google Cloud. OK, so the, the virtual machines, like any other service in the cloud, uh, they are bounded to a specific regions, to a specific locations where you can spin up the machines and where you can run your workloads. Um, uh, Dataflow itself also has a, a region uh, parameter. Okay, so we will see more on on this later. So um, one precaution that we have to to take is that we should try to run the service and the virtual machines in the in the same region. Okay. 
Normally, so this is the default behavior, okay? When even when you set the region, so the matches will be created in the same region. But you can actually tweak your job in data flow to do this differently, okay? So unless you have a good reason, so you should try to maintain everything in the same region, okay? So basically, uh, today data flow is available in the same region as Compute Engine, okay? So uh, their their your choice of a location should really shouldn't really be affected by where the service is available. You may choose your region by, let's say, other, uh, because of other reasons, like uh, security and compliance, uh, because there are regulations and you need to perform the calculation in certain regions of the of the world, OK? And uh, very importantly, too, so if you want to achieve resilience, OK, so in case of disasters, to be able to recover faster and so on, uh, well, you should uh, you should um, aim for uh, geographical separation of uh, of your jobs and and then you can do this very easily in Google Cloud by just uh, setting different regions. So the cloud service, the Google Cloud uh, Data Flow service, it comes with a lot of things. Okay, so we are gonna see some of these things here. Okay, so um, this this diagram on the left we have like the source, like the input of our of our pipeline, and on the right we have the output. Okay, and and data is let's say flowing left to right, OK? And there are lots of things that are done by our, uh, for ourselves without us having to do anything specifically, like, for instance, uh, networking, integration with logging and monitoring, um, and so on, like optimizations, auto-scaling. So we are going to see some of these features uh, in the next slides and how this apply to, um, uh, or how we can apply this to improve the performance of our pipelines. Let's start with uh, some of these first uh, features. First one is dynamic uh, work uh, redistribution or, or balancing. Um, this is fully automated, okay? So you don't have to do much about this, to be honest. Uh, but you have to just, let's say, to remember that Dataflow will do this for yourself uh, automatically, okay? This is one of the advantages of running Apache Bean on Dataflow is this a dynamic redistribution when for some reason the workload is slowing down for instance when you have a hotkeys um, a so-called hotkey is when you are doing an operation per keys and one of the groups one of the keys is much much larger than the others because one key or all the elements with the same key are all processed in the same worker this means that if you have a very large group this worker is going to take a lot of time to process this uh, this data Okay, so what Dataflow makes is actually splitting the load for one specific worker, like taking it away from this worker and putting this in another worker. And by doing this, it's able to um, uh, balance the utilization of the workers. Instead of having a worker totally overwhelmed trying to process a very large group with some data even queuing in the input uh, waiting to, to be processed, and other workers idle because they were processing smaller groups and they have already finished some of this data that is in, at the input it will be uh, reprocessed or it will be uh, sent for, to be processed to different workers and depending on the operation that we are doing so if we're doing for instance a combine by key we send a combiner so this redistribution will all also happen with elements of the same key okay so we will have like a processing by uh, in separate workers by with elements of the sink. The next um, option that we are going to uh, review is the so-called uh, shuffle service. So what is shuffle service? This works only for batch pipelines. Okay, Remember that in Apache Bean, we have two types of pipelines, batch and streaming. This is an optimization that applies only for batch pipelines. Okay, So Normally, when you're running uh, your data flow service, so you have a set of uh, virtual machines that are represented here on, on the left side of the of the slide, and um, everything happens uh, between the virtual machines. If you need to do any shuffle operation, like a group by key, a combiner, uh, to do any kind of uh, joins with a group by key, all the operations that we saw last week that uh, need to shuffle data, so this shuffling will happen normally in the network uh, that is connecting these virtual machines, okay? Remember, shuffling is sending data around from one worker to the other to reorder the data somehow and to be able to process, to apply any kind of these operations. 
if you enable shuffle service instead of this traffic happening between the pipe pipelines so this traffic is sent uh, through a petabit network to some infrastructure that is available um, uh, at google okay so that is outside your project okay um here in this place you don't pay uh, by the amount of time that is processing so here the virtual machines you pay by the amount of time that processing takes so you pay that by the seconds of that, that you are doing stuff so here you pay by the amount of data that is processed okay not the amount of time that it, it takes and because this is a infrastructure that is highly optimized to do this kind of shuffling operations the result is that this will take much less time than doing the same operation here okay and despite having paid for this additional service uh, let's say by the amount of data that is processing this, this additional service because your pipeline is actually now faster you have to pay less for the time that these uh, workers uh, are running and the overall is normally uh, better than just running on the virtual machines in terms of cost and in performance is much faster okay so you save money and your pipeline is much faster so that's the typical application so for any uh, pipeline that is using shuffle uh, using and it's a batch using the shuffle service is a good idea if you have a very simple pipeline that just i don't know like take one file from one place and put the file in another place or takes the records and writes them in a different format and there is no shuffling it's a it's just like a straight pipeline with no groupings or not complex aggregations well then there is no shuffling and you will not uh, benefit from this service but well, these kind of pipelines in Apache Bean are really not so common. So you're using Apache Bean to do complex calculations or to, to, to be able to, to unlock all the power that Apache Bean offers uh, with a uh, large amounts of data and so on. So uh, normally in those situations, uh, shuffle, uh, the shuffle service will, will benefit you. So we're talking about batch pipe pipelines. What about the streaming pipelines? Well, we happen to have a similar service for streaming uh, pipelines. In this case, it's called a streaming engine. And it, it makes a little bit more than just shuffling data and processing the data or shuffling. It also keeps or stores the state of our windows, okay? And, and this is really important because by using a streaming engine, we may use much smaller workers in our streaming pipeline. So when we are doing a streaming, we have to apply a window and the window is no more than grouping elements together and those groups have to be kept around in some place okay um, normally when we are processing data the data will be kept in memory will be stored in memory but we need to keep a date a copy of the data uh, should something wrong happen like a worker failing or we need to reprocess for whatever reason a exception in the in your code and uh, that requires running the, the 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 elements again so you need to keep the, uh, the data around somewhere Normally, that would be the hard disks of the of the virtual machines. With the streaming engine service, so you keep that state here in 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 this service that is uh, available at Google. Okay, because of this, you may use much smaller disks in your uh, virtual machines, and also because of the shuffling happening here, this streaming shuffle, the power, the CPU power that you need here is also smaller. Okay. So you may use much smaller virtual machines for, 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 let's say, for the part that is running on your project. And then pay just uh, by the amount of data that is processed in a streaming engine. If you have a long running streaming pipeline, think of a pipeline that is running 24 seven, like at all times, this can be really like a lot of saving because when your pipeline is idle, when there's no data, it's just waiting for data to come uh, at the input, there will be no shuffling, there will be nothing uh, uh, be, being processed. But you need to keep at least one worker running, okay? So to, let's say listening uh, to any potential incoming message. If the worker that you are using to keep listening, it's smaller in the sense that it's a smaller machine, it, it will be more affordable, okay? So it's gonna be very, very affordable to keep your pipeline running forever, let's say, okay? Because when you don't have data, you're gonna be paying like very little, like very, very little. And when you have data, well, so you will be using the streaming engine service to process this data. You will be paying for the data that you process, let's say. You will not be paying for the data that you don't process or that you're waiting to be processed. And because um, this works, let's say, 
closer to, to, to data flow for auto scaling, uh, it's also it's also it's also better. So and, and also in terms of performance, it's the same as in batch uh, in the in the batch uh, shuffle service. Okay, uh, your pipeline will be faster probably. Especially if the pipeline is complex. Again, if your pipeline is very simple and it doesn't make any shuffle, okay, because it doesn't use a group by key, it doesn't use a combiner, it doesn't use a group by key, it doesn't use any of any kind of aggregation. If it doesn't make any kind of aggregation, well, so then maybe it will not be a benefit, okay? But but normally it will be a benefit also, okay? So um, uh, think that, for instance, just windowing, if you make a streaming pipeline with windowing, that's already an aggregation, okay? So it's very likely that in a streaming, your pipeline will benefit of a, uh, for using a, a streaming engine uh, than just a disabling it. Okay, so we have seen a couple of uh, features that are specific to uh, to the data flow runner that help you in improving the, your performance. So now let's see where are all the decisions that you have to take when you're running in in, a, in in data flow and how those decisions have an impact on performance. So let's see how to actually configure your data flow pipeline, okay? So, so far what we have seen is how data flow works. Now we are gonna see how we choose the right values for our the different options when we have to trigger our pipeline. There are in reality not so many decisions that we have to make, uh, just a few, but um, here I'm including some more that uh, can, can provide the benefit, okay? So um, typically the only decision that we will have to make is the region where we are running the, the, pro the, the pipeline and the project where we, this is happening in Google Cloud Platform. Everything has to happen in the project. Other than, other than that, so we don't really have to make any, any, the, any additional decision. So, but even if you don't have two, if you do, you will get a benefit out of that, okay? So let's actually see where are, where are those decisions. First decision, region. Well, here, um, basically, you may run this in anywhere in Google Cloud Platform. Data flow is available everywhere, okay? So we have here all the regions that where uh, Google Cloud Platform is available and therefore where uh, data flow is available too. The, the blue points are existing uh, data centers, existing regions. The white ones are uh, future uh, data centers that are going to be available uh, soon. This is uh, uh, Warsaw in Poland. It's actually, it opened, I think, today or maybe yesterday. Okay, so this is now a blue dot. Okay, others are not, are not uh, blue yet, okay, like Madrid, but it will be available soon. So anywhere where data flow is, uh, where Google Cloud Platform is available, you may run data flow. Okay, so that's, and then there are, there are no restrictions. I don't know, say that for whatever reason you want to run your workload in Australia because your the Australian regulations that I entirely ignore, okay, this is just a made up example, require you to uh, run this in Australia. Well, that's, that's fine, okay? So that's perfectly possible because you have here in Sydney one, one region and you can just run your job there, okay? So basically you can run in any re region, but you have to be aware you should run in the same region where your data is, okay? Um, why is this? Because when you are sending data across regions in Google Cloud Platform, there's an additional cost, it's called network egress. Uh, depending on the regions, this is really not a lot of money, uh, to be honest either, but it's, it's wasted money if you just set the wrong regions, let's say by mistake. Also, another thing that uh, will happen is the latency. If you have to send data across regions, I don't know, like imagine sending data between the American continent and the European continent. So you have to cross the Atlantic. So that's gonna have an impact in latency, okay? And your pipeline has, is going to have worse performance than it could, okay? Just because you made the mistake uh, by sending data around, okay? I have made this mistake sometimes, for instance, myself. Okay, so uh, you have to, to pay attention to this and make sure that your data is located in the same location uh, where you're gonna be running your pipeline. If you're using Google Cloud Storage or if you're using BigQuery, you have the option to run uh, multi-region buckets or multi-region data sets, okay? Like all the US or all the European Union, okay? So any region within this multi-region will work for this, okay? So this is a very good way to have 
data available in different regions at the same time. So you can easily move uh, your job from one region to the other without having to move the data to another region or without having to pay any network egress because uh, the multi-region uh, data sets that they are available well, in several regions. So remember, think of the region taking into account where your data is and where your data is might be because of regulations, because of a, a closeness to your location and think of multi-region buckets or multi-region data sets to allow you to run data flow jobs in several regions without just changing one parameter and without having to pay anything extra for, for that. Okay, region done. Auto scaling. Um, auto scaling is one of the options that I have mentioned about data flow, that, sorry, that I haven't mentioned about data flow. So data flow is able to auto scale meaning that it's able to adapt the amount of resources that are used by the pipeline to the amount of data that is processed or to the complexity of the processing of the of, of that data so normally you should prefer using auto scaling okay uh, because um, if, for instance think of a streaming pipeline you're gonna have peak and valley moments and if you have auto scaling so if there are no data uh, your pipeline will go down to see well to one worker okay and then if you receive like a peak of uh, input data it will uh, speed up new virtual machines to uh, be able to cope with the additional workload however sometimes uh, especially you have customers trying to run small jobs micro jobs let's say jobs that don't take more than i don't know 10 minutes eight minutes really because the amount of data is really not large but they prefer to use data flow because while well, they have all the pi pipelines already written uh, in Apache Bean. In situations like this, you may actually save some time by setting a fixed number of workers. Uh, the autoscaler needs some time to grab metadata, to grab statistics in order to decide how to react and um, how many workers are gonna need it in the future, okay? So if you're running a job that takes five minutes, 10 minutes, okay, this amount of time, if it's 30 seconds, one minute, it's already like, let's say, a substantial part of the job, okay? And you may save this single minute of uh, data gathering to decide how to autoscale by setting a number of workers that, is, let's say, that's enough for processing. You should know here how many workers you need, let's say, based on your experience of running this job in the past, and just set it and then you're, you're, you will be saving some minutes of processing. Okay, so I have talked about uh, grabbing statistics and grabbing metadata about your processing pipeline. What statistics is uh, auto scaling using for deciding how many workers are needed for a job? It uses two, the amount of CPU that is used and the size of the backlog. Okay, so the backlog is the, the amount of data the, or the, the data that is waiting to be processed and hasn't, and hasn't been processed yet. So um, when the average CPU consumption goes over 70%, data flow will spin up more workers, okay? Because uh, that will mean that the workers are being utilized a lot, let's say, and it's likely that if there are more workers, uh, the pipeline will run faster. So it will spin up more workers. Similarly, when the work, uh, the average CPU goes below 70%, it means that we are wasting resources. We are using more workers than we need because we are actually not using all the CPU of the workers. So we may need, we will probably need less workers and uh, Dataflow will decide to downscale and reduce the number of workers that are needed for this process. With the size of the backlog, it, it makes sense in similar. The, the, the specific numbers depends on the amount of data that you're processing and, and, and the say, amount of data that is used in each one of the steps and for each one of the individual elements processing, okay? So this is, it's difficult to put a number here, but basically if there is a lot of data waiting to be processed, data flow will spin up more workers if the amount of data waiting to be processed is reduced or it's empty, then it will uh, shut down some of the workers to save resources. The typical reaction uh, that I see a lot with uh, Google Cloud customers when 
they configure uh, auto scaling it's uh, setting a maximum number of workers for the auto scaler okay so they are afraid that the auto scaler may become wild uh, crazy and spin up a thousand workers okay and then the, so the, because of this so they set a maximum number of workers and then the auto scaler will not be able to go beyond that number of workers so Normally, in my experience, when we do this, what we are actually is constraining the pipeline, okay? Surely, if we don't put a limit, how the scaling would create more workers, okay? So it would, it would do this for sure, but uh, those workers are needed, okay? That's why the autoscaler is, is asking uh, uh, for those workers to be created. And if you create them, the amount of time that it's gonna take to process that, that, that let's say that peak of data is gonna be reduced. Okay, so and as soon as uh, the, this data has been fully processed and there's no more CPU usage or the backlog is reduced, the, 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 the workers will go down again. Okay, so well, setting a maximum number of workers may provide you some peace of mind, but it's coming at a cost. Okay, so you are just making the pipeline run for longer. Okay, and it is not clear whether setting the maximum number of workers who are actually saving money or not, okay? Because uh, the, the pipeline is running longer, okay? So let's say experiment and don't hesitate to put a large number of maximum number of workers because uh, by doing that, you will be probably even saving money, okay? Despite the intuition that more workers will be more money, okay? But it will be more workers uh, for less time, okay? So the parameter for setting the auto scaling data flow is actually there are only two different options: none or throughput based. Okay, none disables um, uh, auto scaling. Okay, so uh, again, so you probably don't want to do this unless your job is very small and you know it very well and you know exactly how long it's gonna take, how many workers are gonna is gonna use because you're running this every day. So you have run this a lot and you have that idea. So let's say you, the human, make the job of the autoscaler better because you know exactly what's going to happen, okay? Uh, and the autoscaler needs to uh, grab data to decide what's going to happen, okay? Or to predict what's going to happen, okay? Unless you are in that situation, uh, so you want to use autoscaling. Any large job, okay? Any job that takes more than 10 minutes uh, because of the amount of data that it needs the, to process, you will probably want to use uh, the autoscaler. So the autoscaler is actually enabled uh, by default in all the batch jobs. And in, in the streaming jobs, if you are running uh, using a streaming engine, uh, it's also enabled by default, okay? Um, a streaming engine is actually the default mode for Python pipelines. If you are using Apache Bean uh, 2.21 or, or, or later than that, okay? So and we... I think the latest release of Apache Bean is 228. And I'm not sure if 229 has been released yet, or if it's not, it's about to be released. Okay, so, so basically any modern Python pipeline will run with a streaming engine in Dataflow. If you disable this uh, uh, auto scaling, Dataflow will use three workers, okay? Mm, for no particular reason, okay? Three workers might be right for your pipeline, or it might be more than you need or it will likely be less than you need, okay? So set the number of workers if you disable the auto scaling uh, to a number that is reasonable for your work, okay? And if you're gonna be disabling auto scaling, you should know what value is reasonable for your work. And if you don't, use auto scaling. Okay, so um, uh, maximum workers will set, in, will set the, the will, let's say, will limit the, um, the amount of workers that auto scaling can, can use. Okay, and you may use max number of workers and noon workers at the same time without the scaling, actually. Noon workers will be the initial value or the initial number of workers that will be used. And then later on, auto scaling will uh, decide if it uh, spins uh, up more workers or less. So in a situation like the one I said at the beginning, when uh, you actually know the job very well, and you know how many workers are going are gonna to be needed from the beginning, Maybe you may want to use auto scaling, but just set the number of workers from the beginning to this number. Okay, so uh, so so you don't have to wait until the auto scaler decides to use that number. Okay, and later on, if the pipeline takes more time to process for whatever reason, the auto scaler will adapt the amount of resources that are used 
to the demand, uh, depending on the data that has to be processed. So in summary, use auto scaling for large, large jobs. For very small jobs that you know very well because you have been running this very frequently, maybe you want to disable it and choose the number of workers manually. Good. Let's talk about the workers now. Um, not all the workers are equal. So um, um, you may choose different CPUs, you may choose uh, more or less RAM, you may choose higher or uh, lower uh, disk size. But here I'm going to focus on one specific feature, public IPs. OK, so uh, public IPs, most likely you don't need them. OK, uh, my recommendation is to disable. So why is this? Uh, normally in Google Cloud uh, and in all the cloud platforms, you have a quota, an amount of maximum resources that you can use. This quota applies to the number of CPUs, to the amount of RAM that you have to use, to the uh, size of the disk that you can uh, uh, create. And there's another quota about the number of public IPs. Public IPs cost money, not a lot, very little. So you're not going to save a lot of money by disabling a public IPs. But what you're going to achieve is avoiding hitting the quota for public IPs. It's very typical that when you are using auto scaling, the auto scaler cannot create more workers because you have consumed the quota for public IPs. Say that you have 50 public IPs uh, as quota. This means that the autoscaler will never be able to use more than 50 workers. And if you don't need connectivity to the internet, you don't need a public IP. If you're using any other Google Cloud Platform service, Google Cloud Storage, BigQuery, Bigtable, any service, you don't need internet to access this service, okay? Despite what might be, what might be or what might look obvious, BigQuery has a public endpoint, googleapis.com slash BigQuery slash something. Those addresses can be accessed internally in Google Cloud Platform without having to go to the internet. And actually, as a matter of fact, when you use this service, you don't go to the internet if, if you're inside GCP. Everything say, remains inside GCP. So you don't need a public app for this. So there's an option that's called private Google access to enable these private endpoints. And it's a very simple setting, and it will save you the hassle of having to use uh, public IPs. If you're in Java for your pipeline, then there's no problem with this, OK? Uh, because all the dependencies are in the same in the same uh, jar, in a fat jar, in so-called so fat jar. So you don't need to download any dependency from, from the internet. However, in Python, the default mode of operation when you spin up a worker is that the worker will connect to the PyPy, the, the Python package repository, uh, the, the public one, the, the, the typical that we use with PID uh, and, and other uh, tools, and will download the, the packages from there. If the worker doesn't have a public IP, he will not be able to connect to PyPy to download the packages. OK, so for, to avoid this, so you may want to, to use uh, custom containers. Custom containers is a new option for Python where you can deploy an image that will be used for your worker. And if you put already in this uh, custom container the dependencies that you need, uh, I don't know, say that you're using, I don't know, like NumPy, Pandas, for instance, you're using Pandas. So you may put Pandas already in the container. And when you create the worker, Pandas will be there. You don't have to install it to download it from the internet and so on. So you will be um, uh, saving the, the need to use a public IP, and you, your pipeline will run also faster because this is first step where it has to download a lot of dependencies from the from PyPy. So it will not download the dependencies. It will just let's say they will be available locally. Okay, and downloading is a slow step. Okay. It will not be a lot. It's only when you are working, the worker is being created. OK, and once it's created, it's already created and that's it. OK, but well, so let's say if you don't need it, so well, don't use it. If for some reason you need access to the Internet, well, then you need a public IP. Like, I don't know. So you need to access a service that is external to Google Cloud Platform. Then you need a public IP and, and, and that's it. OK, so like uh, uh, no more questions. About CPU memory and this size, I'm not going to say a lot, but just um, yeah, th there are newer CPUs available in the cloud, like every like every year there are new and new hardware. I think the newest ones in Google Cloud are the N2. The CPU performance will be better. This will have no a dramatic impact in performance either, because the differences are minimal. If you have out-of-memory problems, 
because you are handling very large objects, well, then you can try to use high memory workers. And the disk size, you don't have to worry much about this. Normally, the defaults work well. Um, and if for some reason you find yourself trying having to use a lot of disk because of shuffling normally, uh, I don't know, because uh, you are handling very large objects or whatever, then in those situations, you may want to explore using shuffle mode for batch pipelines or steaming engine for steaming pipelines, because then you will offload, you will delegate the hassle of uh, having to have a very large disk to Google, and then you will pay, let's say, by the amount of data that is used. And it will be probably better for you in terms of performance and cost. And for sure, in, let's say, in terms of hassle, you don't have to worry about this. Good. Moving on. Preventable workers. So we have talked about uh, cost all the time. This is a very easy way to save money uh, when running in data flow if, you, uh, if you're using batch pipelines. Okay, so this only works for batch pipelines. So a preventable worker is a machine that Google can take away from you, let's say. Okay, so you pay less money for the same machine. And, um, and if there's any kind of peak uh, moment, think uh, of a moment like Black Friday or like this, let's say this um, moment around the year where everyone is going to the internet. Well, in those situations, that machine can be taken away from you and use those and those resources dedicated to well someone else. Okay, but for this possibility, you actually save some some money uh, in in your in your in your pipeline. So. If uh, your job is not very sensitive to the time that it takes to start the job, uh, you, you, you should consider uh, using flex arrays, okay? Uh, using pre preventable virtual machines uh, with your data flow pipeline, okay? And this is what we call in, in, in pipeline flex resource scheduling, okay? So, so what, 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 what is it this, okay? So what is a flex uh, um, a resource scheduling? So you submit your job, okay? So here is a diagram, okay? Your job is validated, and then Dataflow decides that it, it can be run. This is like any other job, okay? So the job is valid. And then instead of starting immediately, as it starts normally, it may wait up to six hours until the amount of resources that are available in Google Cloud is optimal, and then it will be launched at that moment, okay? And if for some reason it, it has already been like it, it, um, six hours have passed and your job is not triggered yet because the Google Cloud has not found like the optimal moment to run your pipeline, it will run anyways, okay? So it will not be stopped. So um, if the start time of your job is not really a critical thing, you may afford wait for up to six hours. Like for instance, a job that takes two hours and then you run every night, it would be a perfect candidate for this. Then you may save up to 60% of uh, the cost of your pipeline, so pay 40%, okay, just by uh, by uh, by uh, using this option, by enabling this option, okay. One 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 thing that you have to take into account is that if you use flex arrays, uh, you will be using uh, the shuffle service, okay, for batch pipelines. So why is this? Well, so think what happens when if Google takes away a printable machine from you. So um, the machine hard disk hard drive is a storing state. And especially if you, are, if you have done a shuffle, so the, the shuffle will persist data to the disk before it's, it's sent across the network uh, in order in, 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 to be able to, like, to enable the processing of the data if that's needed. If the machine is taken away from you, the state is also taken away from you. And then your pipeline would be in an inconsistent state. Okay, well, so, this can be avoided if you're using data flow shuffle because all this state is kept in the in the in the data flow shuffle service, not in the virtual machines in computer engine as we have seen at, at the beginning. So basically, if you use flex arrays, you will be also using a shuffle. And in summary, if you can wait for some time until your pipeline starts, you may save a lot of money by just using this option. And it's really very straightforward. You don't have to change anything in your code; just enable the option. Shuffle mode for batch pipe pipelines. When do you want to use this? Well, for complex pipelines, I have already said this. If you're using group by key, co group by key, or combine uh, in batch, well, you want to use the uh, shuffle mode. 
the shuffling is delegated to, to Google itself. And you will be paying by the amount of data that uh, that uh, you are using, not the, by the time that, uh, that it takes to uh, for the pipeline to finish. Normally, you will be saving money by doing this, OK? Um, but if your pipeline is actually very simple, sometimes the cost might be higher. So in case of doubt, it's, the, the better is experiment. So take just a small amount of data and check the two options, see which one of the ones is more expensive, and then decide. So uh, uh, FlexRS will, will force uh, um, uh, the use of shuffle mode, so bear this in mind, OK? But um, even if your pipeline is very simple, in this case, this will not be really uh, uh, a problem, OK? The cost will not be higher because you are saving so much by using the preventable machines that uh, uh, the overall cost will be much, much, much lower, OK? And remember, I have already mentioned this. So the temporary results are stored in the Dataflow Shuffle service. So it's totally safe for Google to take away even all the workers of your pipeline, OK? Because uh, no state will be my system state and the, the processing will be able to proceed uh, when there are more workers available. And a steaming engine, when do you want to use a steaming engine? There is a similar reasoning for the, as a, with batch pipelines, okay? Uh, so you offload some of the calculations to Google, the shuffling and so on, and you will be using less resources in your pipeline, okay? You are paying for per, per gigabyte, uh, not per the time of a, of a of, um, of of processing, and if you have a pipeline that uh, that has a peak and valley moments, your pipeline will be more responsive in auto scaling, and it will use smaller workers and more affordable workers in the valley moments and in the peak moments too. But especially in the valley moments, and and you will not be paying for infrastructure that you don't you are not using. Okay, so so normally so the same logic applies here. So if you have some pipeline with a certain level of complexity or an input that is very variable in the in the in in, in, in it, it has peaks and valley moments then you will probably want to use a, a estimate engine for for your estimate pipeline so summary of decisions very quickly auto scaling should i use auto scaling well uh, if the it's a very small job and you are very familiar with it maybe you may want to disable uh, uh, auto scaling but if not, then just yes, use auto scaling and really don't worry more about the resources that your pipeline is using. Dataflow will make a, a good job deciding what, what are the amount of resources that are required. Okay. Public APIs. Well, you are in Java, disable. Forget about, unless you have to use a, a, a internet for, for some reason, like accessing an external service, disable and, and deploy a fat jar. Uh, in, in Python, well, uh, if uh, all your uh, dependencies are pure Python, you may actually download the wheels, the packages from PyPy and upload them by hand to Google Cloud Storage. And this will mean that the worker doesn't have to download these dependencies from the internet because Dataflow will realize that the dependencies are there and it will install them by default to the workers. Okay. Um, and if no, so you are using dependencies that cannot be expressed as a will, which is a bytecode, Python bytecode, and it's really not a, not a, let's say, it's a platform independent, okay? So it's like an application that compiles C or C++ or whatever. Well, maybe you want, you, you cannot use this, but you can start exploring custom containers. Custom containers are in beta, okay? That is why I say start exploring, because I wouldn't recommend a beta service for a production setting. OK, but you can actually start exploring this like as of today. If you are in a batch pipeline, if you are sensitive to the start time, OK, then if you are not sensitive to the start time, use FlexRS and forget. OK, if you are sensitive, OK, you need to start now. OK, you cannot wait six up to six hours. If your code is simple, well, don't enable shuffle mode. Just use the default modes. But if not simple, enable shuffle mode, you're going to save money. In a streaming, it's similar, but uh, it's a, it's more simple. The decision is just enable or disable a streaming engine. If the pipeline is simple, or I should talk also here about the variability in the input, OK? Well, if the pipeline is simple, maybe streaming engine, you may disable it. But normally, uh, 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 it's better to use a streaming engine and use, let's say, small workers to, to save some money. So this is a lot of things, OK? And you may be wondering, OK, so where are actually the best decisions? How, how do I decide between all these? How do I check that uh, this is actually working in the way I expect? 
Well, in case of doubt, experiment and extrapolate. Experiment with a smaller amount of data and then extrapolate from the cost that you invest in testing with a small amount of data. You will be maybe spending a few dollars, like literally, like single digit dollars, two or three dollars in a job. And then you may extrapolate from there in order to decide how much you're gonna be paying with different options when the data is multiplied by 10, by 100, by 1,000, and so on. The, here is an article that uh, explains this approach uh, with a lot of detail. And, and this is the, where I recommend you like uh, um, uh, experimenting, okay? So lots of customers ask me, uh, how is gonna how, how much I'm gonna pay for this data flow job, okay? And literally most of the times I have no clue how much, about how much they're gonna be paying for that. Okay, so we may calculate it, but it depends a lot, for instance, in the complexity of the code. It's not only related to the size of the input, it's also the code itself. And the code could be literally anything. Okay, so it's better to experiment and extrapolate. Okay, so this is all for, for this session. So um, thank you all for, uh, for being there. And if you have questions now, I'm, I'm here open to your questions. Thank you, Israel. Um... We have, actually, yeah, we have a list of questions from Pradeep Sadashivamurti. Uh, first one says, um, can the same key be processed by a different worker? Uh, well, yes, for sure. It depends on, on the operation that you are making. So imagine that you have data in parallel in different workers and you are adding in that step the key. Then in different workers, you will have the same key. Or imagine that you're applying a combiner. A combiner will split the same key in different workers if the group is very large to be able to process it in parallel, okay? But if you are making a group by key, yes, all the elements with the same key will be in the same worker. Okay. Then the next question by Pradeep is, uh, where does shuffle operation happen normally? Uh, I'm not uh, sure. Those shuffle operations will happen normally in the in between the virtual machines. Uh, inside the so the virtual machines are all in the same network and it will it, it will be it will work let's say like a cluster so there are machines in the same network exchanging data across them uh, between okay. them across the network and it will happen with the network and the virtual machines of uh, of the the network between the virtual machines okay and uh and yeah i'm sorry i, I didn't follow up with that it was where does shuffle operation happen normally does it happen at a random worker Oh, well, it will happen depending on, on so the data is split it in bundles. So we saw this last week. Um, mm -hmm. So each one of the bundles may have different keys, okay, for what I explained. Maybe it's the output of a combiner. Maybe you just added the key at that step and then they have the data happen to be in different workers, okay? So the data, each one of the workers will decide, the, well, the data flow service, let's say, will tell each one of the workers to which worker they have to send each, each specific key, okay? Or each range of keys, okay? So that is a data flow service, let's say controlling where are the different keys and where are the destination worker for each one of the keys, okay? And then, so the worker will just send the key across the network to, to, that, to that worker. Okay. Then um, how is a BIM window related to a runner workflow bundle? It, it, it's the, the window is totally related to the runner worker bundles. Okay, so okay. different runners will normally use different bundle size. Okay, it's a runner specific thing. And in a streaming, especially, okay, and the streaming is really sensitive to the size of the bundle. Okay, so my intuition is that uh, the bundles will be smaller. Okay, normally. Okay, so it's like it's totally related. Um, and I'm not sure what the aim of the question. You don't really have to worry about these things, okay? So um, even if you have a very large window in your streaming pipeline, so the worst that it can happen is that your pipeline is gonna be slow because the, the, the window will be persistent to, to this and this kind of things in, in data flow. Okay, so, so in the case of data flow, you don't have to really worry about, about these details, but yeah, it depends totally on the, on the, on the runner, okay? So uh, the runner may decide to divide things in bundles in very differently, depending on the, the type of pipeline and the type of runner, okay? So and normally okay. in streaming, I guess they will tend to use smaller bundles, okay, to to be able to keep things in memory and not use disk so much because, well, that increases the latency in the calculations. Okay, and then um, how can this person create a pipeline that handles generic JSON that doesn't have a set schema? Okay, so I understand that here you mean that I want to apply the schema to the JSON and I want to parse it correctly. Well, so. 
you could load the schema dynamically from an external location, like for the okay. file with cloud storage, or you may have an input parameter uh, with the schema that is used uh, for, for the objects, but then in this case, all the objects will have to use the same schema. Um, so, and then you, you will have to try to apply the schema for, for the parsing step, okay? But um, so in, in general, so, you, well, so, so, yeah, if you are able to read the schema from Google Cloud Storage, so you may apply that schema at the parsing moment without without any issue. So normally, what I would uh, use here is a side input. I would have the, maybe one input from Google Cloud Storage in a streaming, like a polling, I don't know, like once every ten minutes or whatever, in case the schema may change, grabbing the schema and injecting that schema as a side input to into the part do in the do function that is uh, doing the parsing itself. And then it will be available as a local variable inside the process method of the do function, and then so what? Well, so you should be able to use it for parsing the JSON file in that in that process method. Okay. Okay. Now we have a question by Moises. Actually, let me read because it's a, a long comment, and then the question. So uh, Moises says, "Hello, I have a streaming pipeline that uses one hour fixed windows." And then a load laten lateness of 15 days. It performs some aggregation operations. The pipeline process processes a large amount of data per minute. And so where does the pipeline store all this data that is grouped by the windows and allowed by this lateness of 15 days? Yeah. So where does the pipeline store this data? And then is it stored in memory or in the worker disk? And in order to improve performance cost, if it is saved in disk, is it better to use a HDD or an SDD? Yeah, so normally if you are not using a streaming engine, so let's assume that you are not using a streaming engine, the state will be stored in the disks of the workers, okay? And the data will be kept in memory too, okay? So uh, it's persisted to disk in case it needs to, to be reprocessed, okay? but if the window becomes very large and the amount of data becomes really large and you're waiting for late data for up to 15 days, say that you get like a gazillion data in these 15 days, then some of the data will be spilled to disk, okay, to avoid overflow in the memory. And this is automatically handled by, by data flow. So, so the data will be kept in the memory and in the disk in case it needs to be reprocessed or in case it's too much data to keep in the memory. Okay, and okay. in order to improve performance and cost, if it's safe in this, is it better to use HDD or SDD? Mm. Experiment. Normally, I would say SDD, okay, because uh, for performance, SDD for sure, but then the cost will be higher, okay. But the, so the, the, let's say the difference in latency in the processing is going to be very substantial with SDD versus HDDs. But in any case, in a situation like uh, what the Moses is asking here, I would actually use a streaming engine, okay. So this is a, a, a case that the uh, could probably benefit a lot from using a service where like a streaming engine, where all this state is actually kept in a streaming engine and you don't have to worry about whether the disk of your pipeline is HDD or SDD, it will be the same, okay? Because uh, this is done in a streaming engine and a streaming engine is using SDD disk because it's a very fast service, okay? So it will probably in a pipeline like this with a window so, so long, the uh, one hour fixed windows with a allowed latency of 15 days, a streaming engine is probably going to be beneficial here. Okay. And then uh, we have a question by Alexander Sayenko. Um, first, he thanks you for your presentation. And he has a question related to data flow memory optimization for memory intensive jobs. Uh, in case of high memory worker nodes with more than 32 gigabytes of RAM, can data flow use off heap memory or JVM heap will be increased to 64 uh, gigabytes? Uh, well, so if you are, I'm assuming here that you are running a Java pipeline, okay? Because uh, uh, so if, if if you are using a Python pipeline, you will not be running on a GDN, okay? But uh, so if you are using Java, I think uh, the data flow will use the heap memory, okay? It will not use any off heap memory. Um, uh, you, you may actually pass options for data flow to actually, let's say, allocate more heap memory, okay? Um, and another way to to tweak the amount of memory that is used by, by a worker is when when you are um, running in a worker with several CPUs, 
in Google Cloud, uh, let's say the amount of CPU, the amount of memory per CPU is constant. So you have two values, low mem and high mem. Okay, so you have two CPUs, you will have, I don't know, like 16 gigabytes. If you have four GPUs, you will have 32 and so on. So you may actually tweak the amount of workers, logical workers that will run in a physical machine and reduce that and then use even more memory in case you need. Okay, it's kind of a trick. It's kind of wasteful because more some CPUs will not be used. Okay, so it's kind of like throwing money at, at the problem, let's say. But it can solve some specific situations. So, but uh, but normally, so if you adjust the heap size, so normally, unless you have like a lot of memory, it should it should really it should work. Okay, and is it possible in data flow to 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 configure those kind of uh, parameters as you were saying, like here, uh, use compressed? I'm not sure exactly about that parameter. Okay, I don't I'm not familiar with it, but. If this is a parameter of the Java virtual machine, yes, it's possible to tick it. Okay, so any parameter of the Java virtual machine, if you're running in Java, okay, so if you're running in Python, it's different. It's not a Java virtual machine, but then uh, yeah, for the Java virtual machine, yes, you you may tweak any parameter of the Java virtual machine. Okay, let me see if we have questions in the YouTube. Um, no, there's no questions in the YouTube. So having said that, since our next session starts in a bit, uh, we're gonna. Uh, leave it there so that you can take a bit of a rest before your next talk. Uh, uh, we'll continue in six minutes here. So thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a bit. You can stay here. And we'll continue in a bit. Thank you. Thanks.
Hello, long time no see. <laughs> no, long time no see, Israel. After that mini break, we're back for our next uh, talk. Uh, and this one is focused on what you can do to improve the, per the performance of your pipeline. And uh, is this talk also uh, data flow specific, right, Israel? Some parts, but some parts are more generic. Okay, okay. That's great. So uh, let's carry on. Thank you, Israel. Please start. Thank, thank you. Thanks. So it's, it's me again. Okay. So yeah, maybe you remember me from the talks about the, the data flow runner. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move on. So how we can improve the performance of our pipeline. So here I'm going to be talking about uh, some generic advice, although some of the advice is uh, specific uh, to data flow. Okay. So I will try to, I will try to um, uh, warn when something is more specific to, to data flows. Okay. So we are going to be considering things about the design of the pipeline the shape of the data the symmetry or asymmetry in the data it, it, it has a, like a key uh, uh, role in the performance of the pipeline back pressure from external systems inter interactions with the source or sinks and any other external system well, the runner specific options that we have already um, uh, commented and, and some let's say some help from in the case of data flow so this part will be this parts will be specific about data flow but everything we are going to be seeing in the in the first slides is actually generic okay so uh, the design of the pipeline may have a big influence really big influence uh, in in the performance so basically as a summary we need to avoid doing operations that we don't really need to do okay like for instance any filtering so we should apply it as soon as possible okay so for instance, we are gonna do a window in a streaming pipeline, or we are gonna do a group by key. These are expensive operations, okay? Because this will require shuffling, because you're grouping data by using some criteria, and so on and so on. So the less data that you have in these expensive operations, the better, okay? So if you put the filter after the group by key here in this case, so the performance will be much, much worse than if you put it here even if the let's say the semantics of the pipeline is exactly the same okay so you group and filter after that's worse so normally try to filter as soon as possible when you are doing any kind of grouping and applying a window in a streaming is grouping okay so uh, if you put less data in the window that's better too okay less less uh, less resources that are used um <sighs> So if you're going to be applying uh, long windows, OK, so or large windows, uh, windows that are uh, some large, try to reduce the data uh, if that's possible because of the logic that you have to apply. Like, for instance, here. So we, we have to do different combines, OK? And in this case, we are applying different windows in the same pipeline. This is per perfectly fine in Apache Beam, OK? So you, we can apply different windows, OK? If we can achieve that for the large window, large window we can reduce the size at the input okay then so this is this is not much better than trying to do it afterwards okay again so here is the same principle we should try to reduce the amount of data that gets uh, at the input of the window okay because then we will save a lot of money a lot of performance money too but a lot of performance okay so it will be the performance will be much better so uh, even again, if the, let's say semantically the operation can be the same, so uh, the the more you can put the com put the combiner before, uh, so the better. In some situations, actually, uh, um, uh, this combiner lifting, so data flow will try to do something for yourself. But if it's better, if let's say you help uh, data flow uh, uh, by doing let's say the right order of operations. Okay. So remember, any kind of aggregation that you can apply first before the, doing the, the window, like with a combine here, so, so the better, OK? Now, more optimizations. And, and this one is actually a specific to data flow, OK? Data flow has an optimization that is called fusion, OK? Remember, in the previous talk, I was saying that the logical pipeline that you write in your code and the physical pipeline that is executed by data flow are actually not the same. Something that data flow makes is Fuse together some steps. Okay, let, let's have a look here. So we have some, some uh, a pipeline that we have written here with some transformation with a group by key and so on. And the pipeline goes up to down. Okay, this is the input of the pipeline. 
this is the output of the pipeline. And then we are doing step after step, okay? It's just one line. There is no, no, like no, no branches or whatever, okay? So um, it's one of these steps. It's gonna be like some code that we execute, like read, extract words, whatever. Okay, the group by key well, has some internal, more internal operations, okay, because it needs to group things together, etc. Okay, but all the operations that happen between uh, the group by key, these operations here and these operations here, data flow normally will fuse them together and it will be just one physical step. Okay, this is normally better because what this makes is that each one of these steps, instead of writing the output and passing the output to another worker and so on. This will be treated like a super task in just one worker. And it will be kind of, there will be no communication between the steps because it will be just like one, like one line of code after the other, let's say, okay? And normally this works well. However, in some situations, this might be a problem, okay? Think for instance, that this read transform is reading files from a next storage, okay? And then uh, here we have this uh, part do, and uh, it's extracting the words. Okay, so the words of the of each one of the of the of the files. Okay, the input here uh, to the, this read step will be the number of files, or uh, and the cardinality of the input will be the number of files that we are gonna be reading. The output, the output cardinality will be the number of lines in the text that we are reading, and the output of this step will be the number of words. Okay. So typically the number of lines will be much larger than the number of files at the beginning. So the cardinality in this step has increased a lot. There is a high fan, high fan out. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult to, to pronounce in English. Here again, we have the same problem. So here the input is the number of lines, the cardinality of the input, the cardinality of the output here is the number of words. And here we will have again a high fan out because fan out, not fan out, fan out. Okay, and the, a very large increase in the cardinality. And this well because of the kind of operations that we are making here, the type of operation. And here this is mapping the words. So well here the, the cardinality of the input and the output will be will be the same. So when this is all fused together, okay, data flow will lose visibility about what's the jump in cardinality here and what's the jump in cardinality here. And we'll decide the number of workers that needs to be used in auto scaling depending on the input of to this step. Okay. But here, because the cardinality is improving, is increasing a lot, we could actually improve things by doing more parallel calculations. But because the steps are, let's say, tied together, one full file will be always processing one worker, even if one file gives a place to millions of words. Okay, those millions of words will be just processing one worker. Okay, so in situations like this, we may want to break the fusion steps. Okay, how can we do that? A group by key always breaks the fusion. The reason that we have here two blocks is that there is a group by key in the middle, okay? But in order to make a group by key, we actually need to have a key, okay? And here when we are reading the files and the lines and the words and so on, we don't have actually a key, okay? So we are not making operations here per key, okay? Maybe, okay? So then what can we do in that, in that, in that case? So we can use an operation that's called a reshuffle, okay? This is one bin transformation that is available in the, in the Apache bin uh, API that you can apply uh, in between any two steps that doesn't have any semantic uh, uh, impact on the on the pipeline. It doesn't change anything. The input and the output will be the same. If you have a big collection of something, you will have a big collection of something at the output. Okay, it doesn't change anything in terms of calculations, but what it actually makes is it generates from random keys, it applies a group by key, and then it drops the random keys. And the next effect that it makes is that it breaks the fusion. Okay. So for instance, if we put the reshuffle here and I would put the reshuffle here, or maybe here, or maybe in the in both places, okay, this would this this box that will be three boxes here. Okay. And we probably would would benefit from, from that. Okay. So if we are making several steps in a row all together where the cardinality of the output is much larger than the cardinality of, uh, of the input, at the output, we may want to insert a reshuffle, okay, in order to uh, force the uh, uh, um, auto scaling to actually distribute the load across the cluster uh, or across the workers and to actually be able to process the, the data more efficiently. In a situation like that, if we have auto scaling enabled, what it will happen is that the auto scaler will create more workers 
and the pipeline will proceed much, much, much faster. Okay. So remember this when you uh, you are running in data flow. In other runners, this might work in the same way, but if you don't have an auto scaler that is able to detect that the amount of let's say the size of the backlog is much larger than than a, 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 than at the input. Okay, if if you don't have a worker that is a, a runner that is able to detect these situations, well, so the shuffle is kind of useless. Okay, it doesn't have any semantic step. It just force a shuffle of data in the cluster, which is a slow operation because you have to send data across the network. Okay. So if you don't have a clear benefit by, for, for reaching this because you don't have another scaler, well, so this is useless probably in other runners. Okay, then and now I think Apache Flink has some sort of uh, auto scaling, but um, I think most of the runners don't. Okay, so uh, if you don't have auto scaling, this is probably probably useless. Okay. Um, so remember, if you have lots of steps together and there's a very high jump in the cardinality between the steps, put the reshuffle in the middle and the performance will be much better. Another thing that may have a lot of uh, impact in performance is the code, okay? And this applies here more to Java than to Python. And um, it, um, it's, it's a so we're recommending this for data flow, but I, I think this probably applies, it's the same in any other runner, okay? Serialization is a slow. And every time you write data to disk, or the data flow writes data to disk, or the runner that, uh, writes the data to disk to make a checkpoint, or you have to send data across the network, you need to serialize the data and then deserialize at the other end. This could be really slow operations. And also the size of the serialization that is generated could be actually large. So you are sending more data across the network for the same amount of information, let's say. If you use more efficient coders with Apache Bean, you may save a lot of processing time and the shuffle could be could be faster, okay? So by default, any class that we put inside the peak collection has to be serializable in, in Java in Py or, or, or in Python. If we don't specify anything, we are gonna be using the generic serializable coder, which basically uh, so uses, let's say, the default serialization code of, uh, of Java which is slow and generates, uh, generates large objects. If we are able to use protocoder, because maybe we are using uh, protos in our application, uh, we could actually save a lot of uh, processing time by just switching to the protocoder instead of serializable coder. And this is just a change in the declaration of the class. Okay, it's really very, very simple. If we are using, let's say, generic code, uh, we may also always use the Avro coder, okay? Even if we are not using Avro for our data, this has nothing to do with the format of our data. It's the format that is used by Dataflow or the runner in question to serialize and deserialize data, okay? So if we switch to Avro coder, then it will be much faster and it just, let's say, changing one line of code and we don't have to change anything else, okay? Or if we are using schemas, okay? If we use schemas with a row and so on, the serialization will be also much uh, more efficient than the default one if we use, let's say, yeah, a generic a generic class. Okay, so encoding and decoding data, even if it looks like a straightforward, it's a straightforward in terms of how to write the code for sure, but it has actually a big impact in performance, okay? Especially in pipelines that are complex because they will be sending data across the network and they need to serialize and deserialize and so on, okay? So you can really speed up a lot of things just by just uh, uh, choosing the right coder, okay? so or choosing a coder other than the default one in Java. Okay? So uh, this will be much, much more efficient. So this is a very simple change that applies to all runners. Logging. Logging could be also uh, a source of problems. I have seen, for instance, pipelines that for every message that they process, send like a lot of logging, like a, one or more lines of, a, of processing to, to the lower. So think that when you're writing logs, in a way, this is another output of the pipeline. So you're writing data to an output store, like a database or whatever. It's a logging service in the case of a, of a, a Google Cloud Platform. It's a so-called uh, uh, Cloud Monitor, which was previously, previously called a stack driver. So you're sending data okay, uh, across a network, connecting to some endpoint and sending data, maybe not a lot. But if you do this once per element, well, it's kind of duplicating the processing that you're making and that's for sure gonna have an impact in performance. So this could be another source of back pressure into your pipeline. And think of logging. 
do you really need to log so much? Like logging once per message is probably useless because there will be so many logs that it will be like a sea of information and you will not be able to, to actually find anything there, okay? Um, if you are finding errors when you are dealing with your data, our first um, um, approach could be of, or we may think first of just, well, I will log this error and I will go on, okay? In situations like this, it's probably much better to um, uh, send the data to a dead letter queue, okay, to another parallel output with some more information about what the error that happened and some other information that you may use to debug later. And that will make you, it, it will make it much more obvious that uh, there has been a problem, okay, than having to go to the logs and let's say dive in the logs to, to try to find errors, okay, because that would be a lot of logs. For instance, uh, writing some output to be query in a streaming, if you're running a streaming or in batch or whatever, with the job ID, the time stamp of the moment that the error happened, the key of the element that they produced the error, the text of the exception that happened, these kind of things, will be much more informative for you to see if something has happened with your pipeline or not. And that's, that's a dead letter queue. Okay, so if you are logging errors, uh, well, so maybe you 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 prefer to actually use uh, some dead letter queue rather than logging. Okay. Um, the shape of the data. This is gonna have a huge impact in the performance in any runner, and this is really really nothing that you can control. Okay. So if your data is highly skewed, it is like it is. But sometimes, depending on how you write your code, you may actually uh, provoke the skewness, the asymmetry in your data. For instance, if you're using one column as a key and you tag your column with nullable, okay, maybe because of the data that uh, you are getting into your pipeline or the, or the way you have written the code, you will have a lot of elements with this column set to null. Okay, and that null will actually become a hot key because lots of elements will have the null. So be, be careful with using a key, a column or a field in a class that is actually nullable, okay? Because you may end up with a lot of elements with the same with the same key, okay? Like for instance here, so we are processing the location of uh, some data. Uh, so we are grouping by location, like uh, here is London, here is New York, okay? In London, we are receiving 200 elements per second, in New York, 100 elements per second. And these are really large cities, okay? So this is, the kind of volume that we, we expect in this pipeline, okay? But then boom, we have another key with 600 elements per second. Which key is this one? Null, where the location has not been declared, okay? So think of a different key here for these elements, okay? Because you can save a lot of, uh, a lot of resources. Or, well, if you cannot uh, change this, okay? So if you have to deal with this key, well, switch to a combiner, okay? Because then this, Processing will be able to data flow in this case will be able to split it out in different in different uh, workers and the, part the processing will be much faster. Um, in Apache Bean, when you are using a combiner, so when you use a combiner function, you have a, a, you have these uh, two methods that may help you to uh, hint the the runner. Um, about the number of uh, steps or the number of uh, splits that it needs to make for hotkeys. Like for instance, here we could, uh, I don't know, like put uh, here a 10, okay? And then uh, the maximum number of elements that would be processing just one worker would be 60 per second, okay? If we put here a 10, okay? And if we cannot just put the number, so we need to, uh, let's say we need to make it like a decision that is dynamic, like every element depending on the key may use the different number of, uh, of a, a splits there for, for the processing of this high fan, fan out, we can actually put here a serializable function, a function like lambda, for instance, or whatever, um, and that uh, depending on the input, uh, just uh, returns a number of splits for, for that key, okay? And this will be, this will be dynamic, okay? And, and these are uh, not a specific of data flow, okay? So the, the and all the runners will have to implement this in, a, in different ways, okay? Or, or in similar ways, okay? But so this is not a specific of data flow. But remember that, well, if you're running in batch, 
uh, you can always use the shuffle service. And th this doesn't really invalidate the, the previous one, okay? You, you have to use a combiner, but maybe if you use the shuffle service, you don't have to tweak the number of splits that you will have per key and this kind of thing. So you don't have to, to put that. Just use a combiner, the shuffle service, or a streaming engine if you were running in a streaming, okay? So I, I was actually talking here uh, of the example in streaming and I haven't put here a streaming engine, but it's the same situation exactly, okay? So this could be also, a streaming engine, okay? And then you don't have to worry about these pesky details of deciding the number of splits per key or whatever, okay? It will scale up uh, and it will process very, very quick, okay? But just be aware that sometimes you may introduce a skewness in your data depending on how you program your your code, okay? Even if you, are, you think that your input is more or less balanced, okay? You may have groups that are not obvious at the at the input that are actually large, and this typically happens with the with the nulls. Talking about keys and the amount of parallelization that you can do in in data flow in particular, but in all the runners uh, it's the same. The number of different keys that you have is the limit for the potential parallelization that can be applied. Okay, because um, one key, for instance, if you're doing a group by key, one key has to be processed in the same work. So if you have 10 keys, for instance, just to put a number, you would not be able to, to have more than 10 workers, okay? So you may think of ways to actually uh, increment the number of keys. If you, are in, if you are in a streaming, maybe you can try to add some information of the window to the key too, to increase a little bit the number of parallelization, especially if you have concurrent windows or like a sliding windows, for instance, more than one window per element, okay? So you may actually uh, uh, speed up things by putting the window as part of the key somehow, okay? Like the time of the window or, or whatever, okay? So um, uh, in general, if you have very few keys, well, this will be bad because the scalability will be very limited, a very small number of workers. Uh, but if you put a lot of keys, and, uh, so the groups are micro groups, okay, this is not good either, okay? So uh, if you put, I don't know, like a, a, a million of keys and the, on average there's one element per key, okay? So then that's also, let's say, nonsense, okay? And, and then this can, this can really be very, very, very taxing in, in data flow and in, in any runner. Back pressure in the in the airlines in, in the in the pipelines. Sorry, back pressure in the pipelines. Depending on the inputs and the outputs that we are using, so we are gonna have some limits to the scalability of the pipeline or some problems with the with the scalability of the pipeline. Okay, so um, uh, for instance, if we are reading files that are compressed, like uh, with uh, JZIP here, um, JZIP is a format that is not uh, parallelizable, so uh, you need to be able to see the full file in order to uncompress the file. There are other compressing formats that are actually parallelizable. Okay, so if you have this format here, if you have a very large file, that file will be processing one single worker. Okay, because you need to have the full file in order to be able to uncompress it, and this can really be very limiting. Okay, so uh, if you are using compressed file with the JSIP, you will be limiting the parallelization of your of your of your pipeline. In situations like this, you may want to use different formats, like for instance, uh, using the files uncompressed, okay? So you may think that you are saving money because you are compressing the files, therefore you are paying less for storage, but really storage compared to the cost of computing, storage in the cloud is really, it's, it's much, much cheaper than processing, okay? So if you actually uncompress the files, you will be able to save in the computing resources of the pipeline, Okay, and maybe paying a little bit more for storage, but the, the overall bill will be much, much better. Okay, so sometimes intuitive decisions like if I compress, this will be better, it are actually worse. Okay, um, but in general, instead of uncompressed, if we want still to compress files, sure, we can compress, but make sure that you're using data, uh, data types that can be parallelized when they are compressed, like for instance, Avro compressed files or uh, Boon zip, uh, bzip. Would be would be another option. Back pressure is another uh, problem, and th this is a problem normally more with data flow probably than with other uh, runners. So, so why is this? Because data flow can scale so much that it's easy that it will overwhelm external systems. If you are using BigQuery, well cloud storage, PubSub, and so on, uh, things will probably work uh, nicely. But say that I don't know you are attacking 
a MySQL database that is installed in your data center, and this has very small matching. Okay, it's very easy to overwhelm this uh, this uh, matching, uh, this uh, server, SQL server. Or you are accessing here in your pipeline an external service, okay, an API or whatever, uh, and uh, you are doing this one per element. If you are processing millions of uh, elements per second, and that's possible in data flow, so it's very easy to overwhelm this service because you will be literally making millions of requests per second. So what is the solution here? Uh, batching. Okay, for batching, remember last week we had this talk about the state and timers, and and I strongly recommend you having a look uh, at, at that uh, talk because then. The, there uh, we explain how to do this pattern with uh, using uh, state and timers in apache bin okay so basically leveraging the start bundle and the finish bundle methods of a do function and using state variables and and timers uh, for this group into batches might work also okay because they will this will generate a, a pair of key and an iterable of elements okay and then in the next step you might take all those elements together make the call to the external system and return the, the result and then instead of making one call per element maybe you will be making one call per 10 elements and you have reduced the number of calls by 10 or if it's by 100 elements by 100 okay and sometimes this can really be a significant difference in the performance of your pipeline okay so but here the performance is not so much because of the runner but because of the external systems or because of the limitation in the external system external systems so location and external systems can actually be another problem okay the speed of light you may think that the speed of light is really like fast but it's actually much slower than you might think okay like light uh, going through uh, an octave fiber like around the world in a second will make uh, know, like five spins around the world okay so five spins around the world it means one spin in 200 milliseconds that means that if you have to go from i don't know like from europe to asia or from europe to uh, america that will be on average like uh, already 100 milliseconds and the way back uh, coming back to to for the connection so you have to do like back and forth will be another 100 milliseconds so that, that's already 200 milliseconds and when you start to adapt this like adding this for each one of the elements, this starts to be a lot of uh, time, okay? So the region is, uh, is important here, okay? And if you're gonna be using any external system that is located in one particular location, uh, ge geography, so you may want to try to external system to Google Cloud, I mean, you may actually want to try to locate your uh, data flow pipeline in the physical region that is closest to, 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 their, to your to your external service okay and sometimes this closest might not be so obvious because it depends on the connectivity through cables in the between the different regions okay like for instance so in here in madrid and i'm originally from the south of spain very close to morocco so where we could see africa for, from the window even I, I could say but the connectivity between africa and europe is really not that good despite the geographical closeness and it, we probably have lower latency to france or Belgium or Germany or, or the United Kingdom, even the, the seat, and we do to, to, to Morocco, okay? So, um, or to the rest of Africa, okay? So, 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 yeah, so bear this in mind when you're locating your, your service. Okay, so we are, we are almost done here. So, here I'm talking about the data flow shuffle service, okay? So, I already talked a lot about this service uh, uh, previously, and this is specific to data flow. I'm not gonna enter into lots of more details here. Just let me insist that if you have a pipeline with a certain level of complexity that runs in batch, it's likely that you can save money and time. And you can reduce time and even pay less uh, by doing this uh, using the, the data flow shuffle service, okay? despite having to pay for the, for the service. And this is in batch. And if you're running in streaming, it's actually really very, very similar. Okay, So you may not only save in the amount of time, but you may also use, in the case of a streaming, a smaller workers. Okay, and this is really important in streaming, especially if you are going to have a long life uh, pipeline, because having a smaller workers means that when there is no data to be processed, or there are very few data to process, you may just, let's say, uh, use one worker that is really small and you will be paying very little um, for maintaining your pipeline alive all the time. Okay, so, so you may afford to run your pipeline 24-7. So, okay, remember, so this is what we have seen. Design con considerations, filter as soon as possible, okay? And if you're gonna be applying any kind of calculation and uh, agrupations, uh, grouping, sorry, 
and a window is a kind of grouping if you reduce the amount of data uh, to that you, that you put into the window that's better so if you filter or group before uh, uh, applying the window so you will be saving uh, uh, the performance will be much better this applies to all runners the data shape there are li we cannot do much here okay so the keys are the keys that we are receiving but depending on how we are programming the pipeline we may introduce artificial keys that are very hot very large groups okay so uh, um, well, if this happens, well, be careful with how you design the keys. And uh, if there is no other option, well, use a combiner that can just, let's say, improve performance a lot. Sources, sinks, and external systems. Um, depending on the format of the input, you may actually limit the scalability of your pipeline. Think twice before compressing your data, okay? Because you are not saving money. You are actually spending more money when you need to process this, process it. If you have a sync, uh, an output that is overwhelmed, think of applying batches, okay, with a state and timers or other other uh, other approaches, because this will uh, alleviate the load in the external systems. And then, if you're running in data flow, don't forget that you have Shuffle, Steaming Engine, FlexRS, and other options that can actually, let's say, for free, because you don't have to change your code in the, in the sense that you have to pay for those for sure but you don't have to in, invest additional effort in changing your code you can actually uh, gain performance without having to do a uh, match and with this we are done with this presentation and well so it's now time for questions so thanks again for uh, being watching the, the presentation thank you israel um let's see what we have uh so far we have not received any questions uh let's wait a minute to see if we receive any questions either in the youtube or the slack regarding and runners No, uh, parent. Oh uh, well, let me see. Pradeep is right typing something. Let's see if it's a question. We do have a bit of latency, about yes. ten seconds between when you say something and it gets to the. Well, thanks to the for the I, I appreciate your kind words. So it was just like a thank you, <laughs> not a question. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's it then. Thank you so much, Israel. Thanks, thank, thank you. you. Uh, remember, this session is being recorded. We've already published the individual recordings for the session last week. Uh, and um, if, if you find them useful, please share them with your colleagues. and. Please also help us by uh, filling the feedback survey. Um, that is, we we just put it on the Slack. We'll put it again on the Slack and the uh, YouTube chat. Having said that, uh, that finishes our sessions for today. And we'll see you tomorrow with the last day of sessions for this iteration of BIM College. Thank you, Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Bye-bye.